Hello, my BMX nerd friends. Welcome back to another episode of Canode Knows brought to you by Dig BMX. This week, we have Ronnie Bonner. He's the owner of Sparky's Distribution, Rocksteady, and uh, some commercial real estate stuff. It was pretty interesting to learn all about that. You will in this episode. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy the show, uh, share it with your homies. Smash that like button, subscribe, and help us grow. Leave a five-star review if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And that's about it. Uh, let's get into it. Ronnie Bonner. Ronnie Bonner, what's up? What up, Bobby Cano? <laughs> it's a long time no see, man. I'm stoked. I, I was just talking before we hit record. I see Traction Coffee Co. on your company. Yeah. So what is, what's your involvement with Traction? Is, is there a partnership with Shadow going on? They just sent me a cup and a personalized name on it. I was like, wow, dude, like Traction is sick. What, dude, what is Traction? Amazing mm-hmm. coffee, amazing people. Like they reached out to us and Sam Burroughs worked with Mike and whatnot at Traction. And then basically they, they wanted to do a project. So we did one and man, it was just, it was a fun, fun project. It's, it's fun seeing BMXers expand past the t-shirt and the hard goods. They're going into other settings. Yeah. So having and these guys, I mean, the Traction guys are dialed, man. I mean, they, the equipment they have, the way they do it, their coffee quality. I mean, I got it was to a smell fun, the beans. Fun, it's real good right? smelling beans. <laughs> Dude, and those little thermos cups they, they yeah. branded and use. Oh, did you get one of those? Yeah, I got one with my name they, on it. I was like, wow, they, dude, yeah. above and beyond. See, they, they get it. And again, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier. Those guys get it, man. They took what they've learned through BMX. They've applied it out to a new avenue. And it's yeah. making BMX look cooler. Yeah. For real. I love these dudes. I think they do a really good job. And I'm appreciative of anyone in BMX that takes the skill sets and applies them towards a journey, you know? Yeah. So that actually, actually I've been done here. What, speaking of skill sets, what yeah. skills are going to be the most valuable in business in the future? <laughs> do you think just off the top of your head, a couple of skills that maybe I mean, it's an extremely broad question, right? Yeah. Obviously, technology is huge, yeah. but I mean, you know, but to me, the number one, skill set you can have is communication written and verbal man because people are terrible at communicating <laughs> yeah and i always say there's there's two things you can do man like if you if you have communication you can give you get a resolution or an answer and that's all you need man no excuses no bullshit in the middle just dude his res oh shit yeah you're right i fucked up or no here's why yeah you know and and most people skip those steps yeah you know, which is you know, but it's, it's human. People don't want confrontation. They don't want issues. And, and I get it, but sometimes man, just being like straight man is a skill that works really well. Agreed. I say, I think especially I learned something about like, just when it comes to business and communications over email or text, like no, no fluff, just say, say the stuff, leave emotions out of emails. Like, and you have to go into reading an email without trying to like, project your own mood on whatever they're saying because that's the problem with text communication in general it's just like you can say something and then somebody else hears it like the complete opposite of your intention and that's i well, think there's, there's no, value in phone calls there's no tone in text yeah in text. exactly so that's why emojis or ha ha ha's or softening elements are very important because yeah i think everyone needs to think how is this perceived yeah there's nothing worse you probably seen those memes now that everyone's like talking about the the texting and how someone perceives what the other person's saying and it's yep. like oh my god you know? <laughs> ken peel did a really good skit about that He's like, yeah what's yeah. up what do you mean what's up <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly what i was talking about. i forgot who it was but yeah. it's, it's the truth you know and i mean especially now coming out of covid three years everyone in the world is in a little bit of an odd place mentally communication community it's it's a little weird man i, I mean I'm, I'm conscious of it i can see myself in spaces where i don't feel 100 so i can see how some people right now so communication i think is 2023 yeah. 2024 is number one and con- maybe not a skill but an emotion be conscious of what everyone might be going through and it really will soften communication maybe that's not as fun Agreed. You know? yeah. it's like because everyone's going through something right now you know yeah. so it's like and but yeah you know everybody has their own shit speaking of covid how yep. i know i know you're in florida wait yep. so first of all like that reminds me i want to know like your kind of origin story i know yep. like you started ugp you were responsible mm-hmm. for the roots jams but yep. i 
I don't think I ever asked you when I was working with you or around you, like, where are you? Have you always been from Florida or born did you move there? Castleberry, born and raised in Castleberry. Okay, cool. You know, um, yeah, I've always lived here, you know, and, and thank God through BMX, you know, because when I was in high school, man, I thought one of my coolest things I ever did was I convinced the, the guidance counselor that I did not need a foreign language in my life. <laughs> and legally, you have to get it. And she signed off and I never took a foreign language because I never perceived myself ever. My parents, they weren't poor, we weren't rich. You know what I mean? And they, I never thought I would ever leave Orlando. Right. Fast forward, I say it's my number one biggest mistake is that now my favorite thing in life is travel and meeting people. So I wish I spoke Spanish. I wish I spoke mandarin i wish i spoke german or french or something yeah. you know and it's like you know but then again what i was really linked on that really is that orlando is a place i love living i love orlando it, it made me who i am today but because of traveling it's made me like orlando even more because really? it is a small big town you small know? big town if if i didn't travel i might not like it <laughs> you know? that's, that's interesting like if you, so you see what's all out there and then you're like yeah you know i love orlando I had, home's home. Yeah. At the end of the day, home is home. And home is really, home. That's where your network you know. of homies are. That's that's how I feel about Phoenix. Like when I yeah. so I don't for people listening who don't know, I worked for Ronnie and Sparky's. I worked for, I was a Sabrosa filmer for a couple of years and I yeah. moved to I think it was towards the end of the I don't know, it right in the middle of working for you guys. I moved to Orlando and I hated it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a love haven. I get yeah. why people, you know, I but for me, know. man, it was, it was like it, anywhere is what you make it. And I went and for the first while, I think I was very positive. I was like, I was going to yoga class and going to work and trying blah, blah, blah. But then I got trapped into a depression and I was oh, drinking yeah. a lot and eating pizza and getting fat and just being miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved back home. But yeah, yeah I, I've I've never I, actually experienced the good weather of Florida. I was just there for a sticky, nasty summer, dude. It was bad. It's probably the worst time to move to Florida. You yeah, know what I mean, you I know, you get like right now, it's so nice. It is yep. so nice, you know. But you know, the good, the good and the bad. It is know? what it's it is. Like, yeah. I mean, but like again, again, when you look at the half full, half empty lens, now you can see all the positivities. Like we we're talking about the stuff from that trip. But at the yep. time, at twenty two, yeah. It's, you're not thinking in that in that perception, you know. Yeah, but I appreciate you did it because honestly, those are some of our most steezy, best vibe videos that you created during that window. You know, like I love everything you did during that, and, and I think you, your man. your craziness that you're going through also was a good part of your creativity. Yeah, you were actually takes, taking out also. Takes a little bit of crazy to make some cool stuff, you know. <laughs> I'm still very proud of all the, the like the bigger ones, the Sabrosa in Vegas, the Sabrosa in Albuquerque, Sabrosa in Atlanta. Those are those are fun. Um, but let's get back to your kind of origin. So you're in you're in Florida. Like what you started writing and or let's get in. Just tell me the story of how you started writing. Who's like the first pro you met and looked up to? What scene yeah. were you in? Like what time period is it? How old are you right now? I'm 50, 52. 52. Um, just turned 52. Yeah. So happy birthday. I, thanks. Yeah, Late birthday. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I started, started BMX at 11. I was skateboarded first, you know, so I was really into skating. I had a full, I had a half pipe in my backyard, all that kind of stuff. I Sick. had a Madrid to a rat bones. Then I got into Zorlac, which was like my, my big reason between pal and Zorlac really like made my appreciation. of the. What is Zorlac? Style. Zorlac is an old, board company i think it might still be around from texas and okay it's just like john grigley lots of skulls i remember i got this one skateboard down at orange side works on edgewater my grandma lived down the street i remember i brought it home that day to go put it together and she was so mad at me that she was trying to make me return it because of all the skulls on it I was like, oh. <laughs> ronnie you know, this they, is too much death <laughs> she was not into it at all you know but it's but for me, like I was in the skateboarding heavily, but when I got it, I got my first BMX bike in seventh grade. I got a mongoose and um, that just literally, if I wouldn't have gotten that bike, I wouldn't be here right now talking to you. you yeah. I mean, it was like, if that bike was, I still have it. I still sick. have the bike, which is pretty sick. But when I got the BMX bike, I got way more into it, especially because of Florida. It's not like we have like Arizona, where we get concrete ditches and whatnot. Like, 
was like, oh shit, I can do grass, gravel, dirt, wood, whatnot. True. I can ride with my skateboard to wherever I'm going. I can ride across the whole you know, county, come back. I was like, oh shit, this is awesome. You it's know? that first so, taste of freedom and like having, that's the first vehicle. Really, it's funny, man. That's what I say all the time, man. You get your BMX bike and it literally, it opens up your, your neighborhood, your city, your town. Across the next thing you know, you're going across state borders. Next thing you're across in a different country. Yeah. It's like, oh shit, this is cool, man. And literally, if I would have kept playing, because I played baseball for like five years, I played soccer for a season, I played football, I played basketball. I played tennis. I've played every sport you can think of. You Sports know? balls. Yeah, you know, and I'm like, oh, nothing compares to BMX A, but then skateboarding, wakeboarding, snowboarding, mm -hmm. those things are, you know, but that was 11, 11 years old, got into that. Um, I started UGP when I was 15 or 16 in 10th or 11th grade. I was a super Just a fan. young hustler. Honestly, didn't really even understand what a company was. It wasn't, even though back then I always think about like the perception of how to start a company back then was it, it, it's so different than now. Yeah. I, I wish I would have had the perception now to apply then, but it's like when I started, it was more of a crew thing. It was the thing that I was super fans of Andy Jenkins, the art director of like BMX Action, Wizard Publications, like Mark Lumen, which was the most amazing he could write stuff that just made you feel like you were there or even Scott town kind of going from super BMX, whatnot, all that kind of stuff. So it was cool that those guys, they kind of introduced us to art and Xerox and the Xerox aspect, which between 11th grade, which was probably 88 to 99, 91. I really started learning about art and whatnot, but I started UGP I had 500 bucks. I was like, I was washing dishes at this place called Warm Beer and Lousy Food. I saved up 500 bucks because I wanted to get a moped nice. and a motorcycle, <laughs> motorcycle. And um, I saved the money up. My mom was like, hell no, you are not getting that. <laughs> so the money sat there for a minute. And, and I decided to start UGP. And it was a thing where like I was in architect class and I was in my second year of it moving towards. That's what I thought I wanted to get into. And I found some screen printing equipment in my architect class, Mr. Buck's class, and um, took it out. I made the first UGP logo and I printed on some paper. And then I was like, oh, shit, all dudes in class, my friends are all like, they're kind of freaking on it. And I was like, oh, shit, that's kind of cool. So I stole all the stuff, brought it home <laughs> and then like started printing T-shirts and then started selling T-shirts to like the, all the alternative stores. Because at the time I hadn't made a number plate yet. And okay. so I said, Spotted Zebra and Unity were the two stores. And I'd go drop off 12 shirts and I would come back and then they would sell. I was like, oh shit, so I bring another 12. You know, I kept doing it all. And like, these are shit. bike shops or skate shops? No, they were alternative stores. Just, just alternative like, stores. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, they were just yeah. alternative stores, like right in Orlando. And I started selling to them. And I was like, oh shit, so it's t shirts first. What was it like selling to them? Like, just you just walk in their door and say, hey, I have this shirt and it says UGP on it. Would you like it? I, I made shirts, like the first shirts, like these crazy one, like this old man's face that like was this black, huge oversized print front that was, no one had oversized prints that big back then. It was huge. And everything was small logo, big back, back then, okay. you know? Yeah. And then I made shirts, like this guy's like holding a chicken and I stretched his head and there was a like, definition of stress. And then there was another thing, I stretched a mouth and it was like scream. And it was like all okay. Xerox based, you know, things go to the library for five hours collect images, stretch them, do all this kind of stuff. You yeah. Know? And the cool thing about that was, I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like you can, I was like, you can bring down 12 and do this. And then all these old dudes always tell me, no, 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 you need to have, make, you need to have money to make money, which later in life I realized is true. But back then I was so delusional that I was like, cool, 12 shirts, I'll sell those, buy 24, sell those, 48. And just yeah, scale going. up. But holy fuck, that's the slowest possible journey <laughs> you can do but i was so passionate about bmx and learning and and at the time i met chris moeller in that 89 91 ish maybe i don't remember exactly what it was but it's somewhere at window he came to orlando and he it was so funny because he was the test writer for freestyle bmx and bmx or bmx action Okay. And he stole all the shit from BMX, actually, like the jerseys and ODI satin jackets and all these things. 
and he was i have a picture of my scrapbook i took of him like he had a shaved head he's all being molar yeah and he was being mad dog. Shit. dude he's selling all these people stuff the stuff that we saw in the magazines yeah and he was selling it all but do that we actually became friends and at that moment i was like i didn't really understand what a clothing company was back then i was just making t-shirts and and doing things and through that we actually kind of i started um because as actually moving forward a little bit more on that i started doing screen printing in my parents garage i bought all the screen printing equipment all okay. that kind of stuff so I that's a huge printing. investment to start like screen it, printing and, and like wasn't. how much how much was the screen printing thing i bought it all used piece by piece i remember okay. i got a carousel printer i don't even remember what i paid but it could have been very much it had been hundreds of dollars you know what okay. i mean and and I didn't, couldn't afford a conveyor belt dryer. So I would do air dry ink with the old industrial hair dryers, you know, used for upholstery and stuff, drying yeah. the t-shirts and all by hand and things like that. But it was, it was cool because at right after we all graduated high school, cause John Paul, John Paul Rogers graduated like a year before me and he went to California. Yeah. So then those guys were playing in like some East and West coast tours for S and M when Moore had his bus, BW bus. So I started printing all their tour shirts at my house and then everywhere they would go, I would pre-send them to those locations and then they would do that. So basically I end up printing, I have all the art too. I have everyone's art. I printed for everyone in the nineties and two thousands. I did S and M standard TNT mega MCS, um, ride BMX. Dude, that's um, awesome. And I, I, I still have, all the original artwork all the original films all the original stuff which is pretty cool that's very cool that, that's like forward oh. thinking and like i'm gonna keep this and then i'll look back and remember yeah, it, you know but i well i have a room everyone jokes with me they, they say i have a fancy word for hoarding which is called <laughs> archiving <laughs> <laughs> i have one room that i keep air i've kept it air conditioned for 30 years through different rooms and i have all these things that are just historical of vmx you know i mean it's, i love vmx and I'm, I'm a firm believer of like i don't like to hoard lots of stuff but i always try to grab one piece yeah. of something from a project the so time period it could be you know, it could be the smallest little thing to the biggest thing but it's, you know just to try to always have something that tells a portion of that story you know so that's like the first you know big big deal for with was it like under the name UGP that you're doing all the screen printing one. for, yeah. uh, so UGP is the a screen print or a clothing company that is getting contracts from all these companies to do their shirts yeah. and stuff. That's pretty cool, man. I had, it was like, a big thing that it was. It was a long journey, you know. What I'm saying, like, if you think about from yeah. like a, a, a from a business standpoint, you're like, okay, I have to make this art, print this for this company, do that, take that profit, go buy blank T-shirts, come up with art, do it make it market them sell them finally get hopefully some kind of profit yeah so but i didn't understand and thank god i was so delusional because yeah. if i wasn't i think i would have quit you know what i mean like yeah. it would have been like oh shit, this is hard but i didn't really care because it was just a was learning b i'm with all my friends and i'm traveling and and even today my number one concern is not money it's creativity how to make things fun and cool you know oh. so, so let's come back, back to ugp here. but because you just brought us to modern or to today yeah. and i want to talk about we can we can finish your story but we'll pick yeah. pick back up at ugp screen printing for all the all the companies but let's fast forward to right now you got what is your like what is what does business look like for you right now like what are what are you in charge of and what are you excited about for 2023 is there anything that is in the works that uh <clears throat> that i would get excited by <laughs> the tantalized tantalized it's <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything really cool coming up dude that's a really wide question it's really difficult to answer but it's um i mean i can say the one thing i'm excited about 2023 is actually getting out and seeing freaking people yep you know i mean i've missed miss people back to you know, normal so, did so that be a, was covid like bad for you in florida or like the lockdowns I mean, and all that stuff i mean it was just like everyone it was the unknown was extremely stressful thank god we lived in florida because it was relatively i used quotation marks heavily it's like it was relatively normal 
yeah. for Florida. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, <but> it's like, <laughs> you know, but it, it was really hard, man. Like it, it was just the stress of like running out of stuff, not getting in a delays and going from like 120 day production window, 365 production windows, you know, and then now going into 2023, it's almost nor normalizing. But we'll talk about business, supply chains, whatnot. It's just insane. You know? Wait, real quick, what does that mean? The 125 windows versus 365 windows? Meaning you turn in a thing called a purchase order, a PO. And a PO is like when you turn into your maker, your vendor, and you say, hey, I want XXX by this date at this price. Okay. You know, so back in you know, 2018, 2019, you could turn in a PO and have it done in 120 days ready to ship. Okay. And then another 30 to 45 days on the water going from Taiwan to wherever in the world, you know? Right. So yeah, it went from all of us had to go from 120 days up to 365. And some people even had more than 365 days, Yikes! which yeah. is one of the reasons that we'll kind of talk about the, anything with the supply chain right now is, is jacked. Yeah. I believe you know? it. That's what I'm hearing so, rumblings of is that could be the, we could have like serious food shortages or like, like shit could hit the fan. The supply chain, I think, is like this hidden thing from the general public that you don't think about that much. But like everything in our lives, you know, it's, it's dependent on it. And now there was one aspect of the supply chain that was happening during COVID. There's another one that's not happening after COVID. And it's and literally it's happening in every space, every type of business, anything every business in the world yeah it's not just a cycling or a bmx thing you know? right yeah but in our world yeah so 2023 i'm excited because now we can get freaking back to try and get to whatever the new normal is you know right like you know and i'm excited about that and getting back out to events and and hanging out with people you so know? events so, is there any like big team trips <clears throat> being planned is we're the... planning all that right now that is our full 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 plan obviously swamp fest is happening february yeah. 25th which that'll be awesome yeah florida series is going on right now actually had its second stop yesterday nice um, in jupiter so that's going on um usa bmx is doing something in Oviedo, like their first stop for their series i think we'll kind of figure out what our overall plans are going to be by april you nice know? Like, we'll kind of take a little different approach this year just with just how insane, you know, everything is. And in yeah. most countries right now are getting affected extremely hard right now. Like, I mean, I've never in past, you know, you could call country A to country B or mail order A to, to mail order B. And there's always someone doing bad and someone doing good. This is the first time ever that I got on a phone call and called five different countries and I could have recorded a conversation and they were all essentially yeah. the same yeah like yeah, yeah 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 and it's not it's i believe the action of bmx is better than it's ever been man like riding styles locations the amount of skate parks the the perception of riding is so good right now agreed but uh, the economics of just life you know i mean is is going to make it really really tough you know yeah i, had, I mean know? i feel like BMX in gen in general was already tough enough, Hard. and then you yeah. throw in throw in COVID, and then sh shit hits a fan. And I think I don't know. Uh, did some companies go under? Did I don't know if any companies in BMX will ever go under because it's a passion driven true. industry, in which is the beauty and yes, the you know? yeah. It's like yeah. it's you know, but I don't think anyone's ever really gone out of business. You yeah, know? it's like. So, you know, all right, that, that leads me to just a general, give me the short, the yeah. summary of what Ron Bonner's business looks like, um, like from the top to the bottom. Like I, yeah. I've heard that I've heard things like you're, you're vertically integrated. You got multiple things going on all over the place. Like what is, what does the business look like? Like, and also what, after after that, because I I don't, I don't know, I think of like Elon Musk, it's SpaceX, Tesla, all this stuff, and then the, all the subsidiary things that are related to those, like the charging stations and all these little things that kind of branch off, and it looks like this tree. And that's what yep. I imagine you got you have going on within the BMX world. So what is what is the business? What multiple businesses? What what does your businesses look like? Like for well, I mean, we we have Sparky's Distribution, which we started in 1995. That's our distribution company, which is not technically a distribution company. It's more like our 
our clubhouse that is where all our brands live. And we okay. joke and call it the Sparky's Opportunity Center so we can add, subtract, do cool things to our friends, whatnot, create brands, whatever we like to do. The Opportunity Center. Sock. Sparky's yeah, Opportunity like, Center. We're not trying. We, we don't want to be a one-stop all. We're not trying to have 50 brands. We're not you know, we really just want to be real focused on what we're doing, which is shadow conspiracy, which is, you know, our parts and writing gear and clothing. And then sub never Rose, heard sub of it. Is, shadow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sub Rose, which complete bikes, parts, frames, mainly bikes and whatnot and clothing and stuff. And then rant, which is like our, like more price sensitive brand that has a really cool nineties vibe to it. And then we do, then we do, I have another company called um, Rocksteady Supply Co., which is our trading company. Which what does that mean, separate. trading company? A trading company means basically we're the agent for not only our own brands, but a lot of brands. And we do all the QC, like we do all the logistics, shipping to different countries for the different brands. We um, do all their, like do a lot of their, their manufacturing photos, their studio photos. Rocksteady is the first trading company in Taiwan to actually be designed by a customer. Most of the time, trading companies are designed by someone who worked at a factory or may have worked at another trading company. Interesting. You know, so, how did that start? I love the name for that because you want your business uh, to be Rocksteady. That's that's cool. a great and name. The cool thing about the name Rocksteady is I tried. Well, first off, I love the name Rocksteady because of like the 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 trends in popular culture. Rocksteady crew break dancing whatnot and that yeah. was the, the beginning of everything in my opinion cool you know so it's like punk rock and hip-hop yeah you know so it's like um so rock State supply co actually translates to really cool as a it means foundation stone in mandarin which means the cornerstone of a building without that stone nothing else actually stays yeah stable. so Hence, that's why we chose that name. When did that both. start? Did did you start that out of years ago, ten years ten ago? Years ago this March. Okay. And I had to start it because the crazy thing was, is I was like, I was all of a sudden one day we got a phone call from my old trading company. I won't mention their names, and I got a company from China hit me up, going, "Hey, we want to reorder more stuff," and we're like, "What?" I was like, "Because we at the time we kind of we didn't allow anything being sold into China at the time." You know, so I was like, what? And my product director, Greg Lanthorne, was in, in Taiwan at the time. And he was walking around. And all of a sudden, I call him. And I'm like, hey, do you guys got this email or this, this email? He's like, what? And he walked around this warehouse of the trading company just by chance. And he saw a pallet. Come to find out, <clears throat> you know, you know, assumably, they were making 20% more of every single one of our product and shipping into China. Hmm. But at the same time, I found that out. I found my dad was dying of cancer. So I had to kind of step back for a minute, I had to think, and literally, I had to make a decision. There's two choices. You can do a satellite office, which means it's just an extension of your USA or European office in Taiwan, which means you can't do any other work for anyone else. And it goes back and forth. Or you can start a trading company, which means you can open up to everyone else. I knew that I wanted to take everything I learned and share it with the other brands in bmx yeah so that's dope i just but through that man these people that i was going up against man like mafia style man i had to become an expert at taiwanese law i had to try to hire a lawyer I, I had to learn and yeah. it's very 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 different same fundamentally laws almost in a sense but the cultural differences is insane yeah. when you're talking in business so it was quite hard it was literally I'm not a, I'm a very conservative business person and in person in general. And it was literally a double down. I doubled down. I was like, look, I'm going for this. If I fail, I'll lose every single thing of my life. Sheesh. I would lose everything. And yeah. it was scary. But 10 years later, I don't like talking about the brands out of privacy that we work with, but it's, right. um, we have, in my opinion, the best brands in BMX. I believe you know, it. That we yeah. work with. And I'm really stoked. And we have our own brands. And and that was a really important thing for me because something in business is you'll never control the Z unless you control the A. And that yeah. means something to different to everyone else. But to me, I'm not trying to be vertically integrated, but I didn't want any more kind of gray area or scenarios for me or my or my my partners that I'm working with, you know, right. that I didn't want that to be the next. So I was like, that's great. You know, so that was crazy. So at the end of the day, that's, and now we have Juvie Hall also, which is 
our retail space uh, literally across the street from our office, which is because the thing is with our brands, everything's virtual based. Yeah. So how does a fan or someone that wants to become a fan of what you do become physically immersed in what you do? It's really difficult now because back in the day, you're at so many different events, so many things that can. So yeah. I want to create Judy Hall as an event space coffee shop that it's just so happens. Juvie Hall? Juvie Hall. Okay, gotcha. It's actually the name. I started a store in 97 downtown Orlando that was called Juvie Hall for a little while. I had bars mm-hmm. on the window. You had to ring a bell to get in. And it, it was It was kind of wild. So we wanted to bring that name back because it's, it's a fun name. It's, it's actually from a movie called American Me, which is all about juvenile detention center. If you're going to check it, it's a crazy okay, movie. Okay, I will. So I like the American me, I saw this name and I was like, oh my God. So, so really like Julie Hall now is like our space that we do a lot of events and whatnot. And we're trying to bring every different subculture into so, one place that BMX, our brands, but BMX is presenting. So it's not and, just BMX. It's for, you know, it's the skateboard homies, the you know, video premieres for maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if they snowboard in Florida, but video premieres it's for me. all the, all the different well, like disciplines. The skateboard, the skateboard Alliance crew. Um, awesome guys. Skate, skate plus skate shop in Orlando. Awesome skate shop. One of the best in the world. Yeah. And they, um, they all did the skateboard Alliance skate park Alliance there, which they're trying to work with BMX and skateboarding. So they came or we don't sell skateboards. We don't sell it's, it's our brands and BMX only, but our idea. And I think everyone in BMX wants this idea. I mean, like I was the first person in, in BMX and cycling to actually bring fashion into BMX. So we did that in 2006 with the shadow invisible man project that we did yeah and that bike actually that bike actually taught us how to make bikes which then ryan and i were like oh shit we can do this so we started Sabrosa. nice but moving backwards we were the first ones to take a seat and before that it was fabrics and a logo and that's it we were the first brand to say hey in cycling say hey let's make seats canvas is like a skateboard deck huh you know and that's when seats changed that was our yeah. our number series you know the og so, shadow seats were sick I love it. So for me, that's the thing that's always been super important is like the presentation, not only to ourselves as BMXers, but how do you perceive it to others, you know? Yeah. So street fashion, fashion sense, you know, and then trying to always keep blending even car culture to BMX or skateboarding to BMX or street right. fashion. So we've done projects with now with the hundreds, Invisible Man, we did Osiris, we did Vans multiple times. We've done Information, which is the, the project we just dropped like last month. Um, I'm probably forgetting some. But That's it's, dope. It's, yeah, I want to linger so, on, um, we'll get back to that. I want to linger yeah. on, because you mentioned getting rock steady started was like going against mm-hmm. the mafia. It, I'm, and I'm picturing in my head, like you are overseas and the culture difference of like, do I bow? Do I shake hands? Like what, um, what paint me a picture of, you know, what was the, the moment that got your heart racing the most when you were getting that shit started? Man, cause you're doubling down and then there's a culture it's difference. Scary. Yeah. Tell me something. I'll tell you right now. I'm a very no gray area kind of guy. If I have a, if you have a problem with me, I always say, come to me and I'll give you an answer or a resolution. You won't get a, an excuse. Yeah. So for me, if I'm doing something, I'll come to you and say, hey, man, I'm about to do this because I feel like it's the right way to be. So I applied that same logic in a foreign country. So I went to these people and told them I'm leaving now. Oh, man, they, they, they went after us. They were like trying to get different factories to cut us off. They like, honestly, I probably lost forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in molds because huh. some factories didn't want to work with us you know and then it was like but the funny thing was fast forward six years eight years ten years like oh you want to work with us now okay (laughs) (laughs) you know but dude it was really scary because especially as a round eye going into (laughs) yeah you're like hey man you know (laughs) like it was a little i had to prepay all our orders for like a while which is really difficult I believe it. You know, and, and just learning. And I have a partner named Stephen Liu. He's a phenomenal person. I've known him for 15 to 18 years, probably. He's okay. Taiwanese. Okay. And he is an amazing dude. So him and I both took huge risk yeah. you know, doing it. And But ultimately, I'm the kind of guy, man, I don't lie and I don't steal. 
Yeah. And when someone does that shit to me, my brain just does this shift that's insane, you know, and I don't know how to how to think, you know. What I, mean? <laughs> yeah. I just I just go, you know. And yeah. it's like but what was, was the cool. biggest hurdle in getting Rocksteady started? I mean, obviously, like being transparent up front and saying, hey, I'm yeah. leaving. That was a problem for them. They're like, no, I would have done that again. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then they're trying to get you blacklisted from factories. Yeah. What, what was the biggest hurdle that you had to overcome to make it happen? I mean, besides being scared that I was making the wrong decision and did I mess up? You know, I was like, oh, God, did I did I not? You know, um, probably, I mean, Stephen and I both know how to set up businesses and do things. So st structuring the business, yeah, it was, we had we had finance, we had investment money. It was really difficult getting it set up. But honestly, it was probably navigating back like the communication and, and dealing with people. And then, you know, I mean, yeah. it was funny because I heard rumors that some of the factories were having gambling pools if we were going to survive or not, <laughs> no <shit. laughs> which was crazy. But ultimately, like I said, that was 10 years ago. So, yeah, you know, but yeah, I think, I think as always, the number one thing is humans. Yes. Humans are freaking insane. Yeah. <laughs> For real. Know, including myself, you know what yeah. I mean? You know, it's like, it's, I think that's probably the hardest thing, you know, and then just getting it going, you know, and stuff like that. But honestly, we, we, we already had our brands and we basically, I'm a very, like I said earlier, I'm really conservative. So all my business models, if it can't survive on worst case scenario, I don't do them. You know, hmm. I'm not the kind of, Smart. most people yeah. look at the other way. Most people are like, oh, I think I could do this and this and blah, blah. But in BMX and cycling too, it, it has to be more passion driven. Yeah. Because like we were talking about earlier, COVID was hard and now is hard, but BMX is always hard. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? You know, I mean, we're selling limited edition products that are super high quality, and that typically doesn't at affordable prices. Yeah. Those three points don't typically work right. together. Yeah, it's yeah. either like you, you gotta pick two out of the three quality, uh cheap or uh fast or whatever. Yeah. Like Yeah, 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 you know, and that's what it is, you know. <laughs> you know, but yeah, so the rock steady thing was definitely was definitely difficult would you say that's the most like exciting business adventure that you've started like or at least thrilling because like, i feel that's going into uncharted territory i'm i'm picturing you like awkwardly trying to shake somebody's hand overseas or something and like they, they go no 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 like and just bow well, did you have you know, to go over there for in-person in-person meeting absolutely uh, yeah you know, absolutely you know it's funny with that thought fast forward to what actually this year is 20 years of shadow. So Sick. 21, 22 years ago, I flew to Taiwan by myself and I knew no one. I flew there. I went to Japan first from Japan over to Taiwan. I knew a guy from this, this place I sold UGP clothing to in Taipei, which is the, the capital. It's in the North part of Taiwan. I flew in there. I convinced him beforehand that his name was Tony. I was like, hey, Tony, would you drive me down to Taichung, which is a three-hour drive? So I flew into Taiwan. I get there. At the time, my passport got washed. So what does that mean? Oh, so, okay, yeah, it yeah. It got washed in the laundry. So yeah. I made it to Japan, no problem. Japan into Taiwan. I show up in Taiwan. And 22 years ago, Taiwan airport, it looked like your elementary school or jail, all exposed blocks, all white, dingy, huh. light. It was like... So I pull up the thing and I hand my passport to this guy at the customs. He gets it. He looks at it. And I could tell there was something up. All of a sudden he says something. This dude walks up with like a trillion medals across his uniform. And he's like walking up. And all of a sudden he grabs it. And he says something manner. And he's like, da, 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 da. And the only word I understood, because this is not far after 9-11, I believe. Yeah. All I heard was the word anthrax. And he drops my passport. Oh, no. I've literally in my life never been so scared. Never. Never been so scared. that I literally felt like I was going, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, you shaking. Know, yeah. <laughs> dude, shaking, shaking, shaking. And next thing you know, 15 minutes later, they let me out. I'm in the country. And I drove down. And I just started going to factories. And I knew this one guy that I kind of did a little business with, with UGP, a little number plates, pads, whatnot. Yeah. I'll buy him to start looking around until I 
So I kind of figured it out. But again, it kind of goes back to myself. If I want to do something, I just set my mind. And like yeah, that, man, I that's wild that, that you just went by yourself to start Shadow <laughs> and just cold calling, cold walking into factories. That's amazing. I mean, when I think about it now, I'm like, you're an idiot, man. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> but I was like, look, I got to figure this out. How was my, I'm a firm believer that you cannot design unless you study the manufacturing process. Okay, I'm with and that. And you have to, you know, for me, I do that with everything I do now. Like, if I'm going to try to design something, I will learn how, I might not be able to weld, but I understand every aspect of welding or like sewing or construct, like clothing. Right. I could pretty much walk you through probably any type, except for technology, you know, but like yeah. walk you through things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, I had to go there. And I, when I started it, I did a case study. I took a grip and I said, look, I'll do a, uh, I'll do a design. I sent it to Taiwan. And then I found the oldest grip maker in America called Hunt Wild. They're actually out of like Tampa. Okay. And I, so I sent them the design and I said, hey, let's see if I can make Shadow a USA brand or Taiwan brand. It, I don't remember the real exact numbers, but it was something of this. I think it was $1,500 back then to, to $3,000 for a mold in, a, in Taiwan for a grip. Okay. USA at the time was 20 something thousand dollars. The unit cost might have been 75 cents a grip, and it was like a dollar to two dollars a grip in USA. So after I started doing all the math, I was like, man, it's either try to do this brand or don't do this brand. Right. So I went for Taiwan. Yeah. As, I know. mean, it's logical. There's something cool and, you know, patriotic about built in USA, but if the numbers don't work, it doesn't work. For people who don't know, what is a mold? A mold could be a many different things, but in, some, in the, the thought of a grip or injection molding of rubbers or plastics, it's usually a big block of aluminum that's split in the middle, has different entry ports that the material can be squeezed with high pressure into the molds. The molds open up and it extracts the unit out of. And then so you got mold, your product. Sometimes, you yeah. know, those molds can be, now a grip mold might be $8,000. Yeah. Or a tire mold might be twenty five thousand dollars or something right. you know so it's it's huge chunks of metal you know so for 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 like example like you can't make a new design of a grip without opening up a new mold or de like designing the mold right like if you okay. if you're gonna do an, a a different grip you got to invest in the mold and then you know maybe it pays itself off after x amount of that's super <laughs> interesting what other <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What, what other products require the initial investment of getting a mold? Tires? I mean, tires do, grips do, sometimes like stems, because like if you do a forged stem, which is actually technically stronger than a CNC stem. The funny thing about CNC is, is everyone in BMX or most cars, whatnot, perceive CNC as a higher quality. CNC actually technically is for sampling. Huh. It's not really made for, say, because it's not, it's not per unit efficient cost wise yeah you know but it looks cool everyone now perceives all the lines and the engraving marks that the chatter makes when you're cnc'ing what as, does cnc mean stand for god what is it or generally what does it mean I don't... god i know it too i'm like <laughs> miracle anyways it's it's um it's you program like Byron Anderson, who is our SolidWorks designer, who was one of the original Shadow Riders, he does all of our all of our product designs, which we'll talk about him today too. He does SolidWorks, which is a uh, it's a solid yeah programming. So he does that, and then he'll take that file, create it, and then send it over to he can do a rapid prototype out of like plastic or whatnot, and then then you can take that file and send it to the factory, which then apply it into a CNC machine and make your sample. Okay. But like a lot of our stems are forged, so you have to open up a mold, which I don't know what the mold costs on those, but it'd be $10,000 or something. You open up that mold, then you could take that. It's actually really strong because you change the grains in the metal and it actually becomes stronger. That's interesting. I'm not a metal. Yeah. Byron could be way better at speaking on the technical level of this than I, but it's yeah. like, yes, you know, so when you do that, then you can go in and see and see it a little bit and make it look nicer or get certain details that you might not be able to get in a mold. Interesting. You know, besides cool. forgetting what CNC means, which I know, which is embarrassing. Computerized you know, numerical but, control is that? That's yes, what came that's up it. on Google. Yep. Okay, yep. That's got it. it. Yep. Yeah, I knew it was all. Why am I having a brain fart? Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting.
Yeah, but you know, like that's the type of molds, you know, I mean, sometimes like you might just have like a washer or something goes in something that's a mold or like the shadow interlock chain. Yeah, you know, we had to make the pins are a mold, the plates are a mold. Oh, we actually boy. Had to make molds for actually changing the 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 automated assembly factory. So we had to get molds to put in the different machines to huh. handle that chain, you know, and that's and something stuff. that you don't think about too often. You're just like, okay, this chain exists. I should buy it. But you don't think about like all the little, like all the things that had to well, happen in you, order for you, you to get it. About it. Like a t-shirt, you know, you're going to have a mold for each color to get screen printed. Yep. They call that a mold or a screen, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so you're like, here's all this. Or like, you know, like you have to open up films. So you got to send it off to get the films done out. Now you can go digitally to a screen, et cetera. Or like, I mean, almost everything takes some type of, let's call it setup cost, you right. know? So, yeah, that's one of the things that's really hard to understand. It's like, man, then, then once you even get a mold open, then you have to test the product, adjust it, adjust the molds sometimes, yeah, and then go through the whole process. It's a whole thing, man. And you, we just take it for granted. We're all like, yeah, it's easy, blah, blah, blah. This, I got a cool new stem is out, but <laughs> it's wild. It's pretty wild. It's definitely intense when you start thinking about costs. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You yeah, know I mean? you know, it's a gamble. That's part of the. You got to play the the law of averages in almost everything in life, right? But especially yeah. in product design. Okay, so you know? let me just to understand Ron Bonner's business. We got Rocksteady. Is that the top? That's the trading company. It's, is there anything it's kind above? Of off that? to the side because American Mentality is our corporate company. Right. Who I remember that. I was trying to remember Shadow, the name that was on the checks AMI. that I was getting. Yeah, American Mentality. <laughs> so that's yeah. that, which is Sparky, Shadow, Sabrosa, Rant. You know, um, we also have Shadow Writing Gear. We still own. That's a separate Netflix. company. They're so, all, when, yeah. does that mean that all of these are different LLCs, or is American Mentality the yeah. LLC, and then everything's underneath it? How, everything is there. Trusts mentality. involved. How does it? How does the well, structure we work? Trust. Okay, we have a trust. You know, we have. The American Mentality is the the LLC, the Inc. Incorporation, and then everything else is a DDA, doing business as. Okay, gotcha. It all falls underneath this. Now we do have lots of separate LLCs within this too, you know. So yeah, you know, Rocksteady is a completely separate entity. It's not part of it, you know, but it's it's part of me, you know. So, but it's yeah. not part of AMI. You know? Okay, so we got Rocksteady over here, and then AMI is the big umbrella under which there's Shadow Sabrosa Rant. Yep. Shadow Riding Gear, uh, Juv Juvie Hall, the yep. actual distribution center. Anything else? What else? What other businesses that's, you got? That's basically it. Are you um, an investor in any other businesses? Like you got your hand in multiple pots? No, I mean, I have been in past for different things and things like that, but this is all I have at the moment. Obviously, I do stock market, do all that kind of stuff, but not BMX well, related. I think that you do some stock time. market shit? I do quite a bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, How'd you yeah, get into that? Lot. How does one start that? That's something that's crossed my mind. Like, I want to try, but I have no clue where to even start. It's, it feels like oh. you're just guessing and gambling. I mean, I'm not a gambler. Even though everyone says you should go gamble. Like, I don't gamble because every day of my life is a gamble. Yeah, for real. So <laughs> I was very reluctant. And now I wish someone would have walked me through in my 20s on, look, dude, just put 100 bucks into something really secure. Every single week, every single month, just do $100, anything, because – it compiles, yeah. you know, like you can make, so honestly, basically when I was in my late forties, I was like, I read a couple articles and like, look, man, if you don't get your shit in, in gear by 50, you're not going to be able to have any retirement. I, I'm BMX, you know, like that's not, that wasn't a thought process, you right. know, it's like, yeah. you know, but it is one of the things I speak of a lot to our team dudes, employees, everything like that. It's like, man, like there's a lot of really secure type avenues to take that you can make a very reasonable return on your money yeah you know and for me it's just so i've just for the past like six years i've just been putting it away you know interesting and, and it's one of the things i constantly talk to our team dudes about i was like i'm always like I, I always try to be the right mentor to anyone that's within my group you know and i always try to get because i obviously can't pay everyone a ton of money but i can try to always be there to help everyone with the right advice you yeah. know, and try to help everyone understand because I my parents are awesome and they gave me great advice but they only knew what they knew right you know and now now in life today we're blessed to have so much knowledge you yeah. know and it's like it's pretty cool so it's so it's definitely something I had to do because obviously one day not gonna keep 
doing everything. Yeah. You know? and it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is it, are you uh, doing any real estate stuff? Yeah, yeah. I have a whole, I have a holding company called Movement and no, Novo Properties. So I own only commercial property. Interesting. So I do, I commercial do real estate. Cool. Yeah, I only do commercial. So Why? I have residential. I'm too, I care too much about people. And when you do residential, it's really hard to not over care. And I don't like how it makes me feel. At the end yeah. Of the yeah. I just Being a like, landlord. You know, the house like, I had over there in Winter Park that every BM expert from Scotty Kramer, Ryan Scherr to you probably may have gone, I don't know, but everyone was going, lived there at one point. Yeah. And I had that. I bought that. That was crazy because when I was 26 years old, I realized that there was a state program that you could buy a house for $4,000 down. <laughs> What? So where's I, that at I, in I, here? Yeah. I want that. <laughs> I would do four thousand dollars down. Grandy had to get PMI insurance. You had to do all that kind of stuff with it. So I found a house for seventy nine thousand dollars. I didn't even have four thousand dollars. I had fifteen hundred dollars in my bank account that year. I went to my grandfather, borrowed the the remainder of the money from him, paid him back with interest, bought the house. Basically, had the house till last year, sold it for four hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Okay. And cool. It was mainly paid by renters, which and yeah. BMX, which is, I lived there for quite a while. And that, actually, I was in that house when I right when I started Shadow. Nice. Know? So a historical you know, house is that the one where um, I was just talking to Joe Joe Simon, and he said that he was <laughs> he was at your house working on Shadow yeah, the Calling so and good. missed a wedding, and because he was too stoned <laughs> working on the video. I was like, hell yeah. Dude. <laughs> Different uh, house, a great experience. Yeah. Joe Simon is like, I always knew Joe Simon was destined to kill it in life in a yeah. video or business. And God, he's, he's, he's special, man. He, was do. he is, yeah. Cool as hell. He exceeded all of our expectations. That's really crazy how it made like, me laugh. Like, is. I, I, cause I, I've always smoked pot my entire life. I've yeah. always, but I'm not, I remember during that window that I was like, damn, son, you gotta like, he was like he said in his interview, like I felt like I had to, and I was like, okay, man, I'll get it, you know. You're good. You know? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it was so much fun, man. I love like, that. That was still that everything's new and everything's shocking period, and I yeah. was thinking about that like time period, which is awesome. You know, it's like um, it's yeah, Joe's yeah, Joe is so awesome. The the way that shadow was unveiled to the world i think was a really cool thing and i think i would imagine it was intentional on your on your part because you're good at marketing to make it like a, a secret con conspiracy and just like very subliminal you know tease teasing it at first like what was it like unveiling shadow what was the strategy behind it and you know, what was it? What, was it intentional? And tell me about the origins of Shadow and it how it came out. It was really intentional from shock awareness and finances. So I kind of was thinking about everything I was doing and, okay, how do I do this? You know? And then so we basically back, that was the, the internet was around at, that, at 2002, but it wasn't yeah, around exactly. as it is today. So everything, we were one of the earliest adopters of guerrilla marketing and viral marketing. The, the concepts and the titling into it. So one of my thoughts was, is like, as I was picking the team and developing everything, what I ended up doing is I took, I took 40 people and customers that for, I don't remember how, I think it might've been four to six months. I can't remember exactly. And I took these little Xerox pieces of paper, which I still, I have them on the, the shadow Instagram or our shadow page, but I made a little page that the only thing consistent along was these a crow head, but it was weird Xerox saying like the shadows upon you or, I'm watching you and these weird, weird, cool Xerox elements. I put them in these envelopes. I would do like an address from like say Atlanta, Georgia. Then I would mail all 40 envelopes to San Francisco and have my friend throw them in a mailbox. Then we get a San Francisco stamp, but have like a Georgia address. And I would change it every one I did to all 40 people. So they never knew where it was coming from for the six months. So I wanted to keep it secret. That's interesting. So I kept mailing all these things. And then either the fourth month or the sixth month, it might have been a month or two. Well, let me back up one second. Like I, we started April, 2022 at Roots Jam, which we'll talk about that too today. April, 2002? Like, 2002 is when Shadow starts at Roots Jam in the middle of the night. I didn't really tell anyone. And I went around and spray painted really middle of the night in the dark, the, sh the shadows upon you. And I just 
stenciled it in all these places. And then I snuck, we snuck stickers on all the pros bikes, everyone's bikes in the middle of the night. Everyone left their bikes there. So I went around yeah. all. So then basically we had, I, I think we had three of the five guys picked. So I had an RV that I was sleeping, a small little RV. And it's still fun. I have a picture that I found online. Cause there was a game foot down in front of our RV and I found a picture in a video Sick. of the RV. So basically that was the year we still had to pick up. We still had to get Alistair and maybe Ryan sure, but no, Ryan was down. I think it was Alistair might've been the last component that we wanted and we knew he was coming. So who was the OG five? Joe Simon, Alistair Witten, John Jennings, and Ryan Schur. Dope. You know, so Squad. very eclectic, very different crew, you know. Yeah. And then so basically that was April. So then from April on, I did the four to six month all the way till April, April, May, June, July, August, September. So yeah, it was probably four to six months because September, I believe, for America, it was always Interbike. Okay. So the month before Interbike, I can't even show you the box. I made these little boxes that I screen printed with crow heads and had a label on the front that said one of 40. And then inside, I personally, I sewed all these little hand puppets that look like shadows. Nice. And I put a flashlight in it and an instruction manual because everyone was guessing it was a band, a video game. It was a this. It was, no one knew. So I put all the guesses. I put all these funny how to use it. And the last page just still didn't define what it was. It just said, come to this booth. And then here's this. I sent the box out to all 40 people and they had to come to the booth and actually to see what we were actually doing. Nice. Which was, was, was at cool. the time, what were you actually doing? What was the first like um, shadow, shadow product? Arts. One of the big things for shadow was, is before shadow, you, most people would start a brand with one product, maybe. So yeah. my goal was to have, I don't remember how many it was we had, but we had like four or five products like grips, stems, sprockets, and tires for launch. And then in our chain came out second, second launch. Oh. You know, so we had full products. I wanted a full parts company. You yeah. know, I didn't want to just have a thing. You know, I wanted to just be a real thing, you know, that we went into, you know. Why start with just a parts company versus a full blown frame company? And why is it that like there are parts companies and frame companies? Why is it split up? Why isn't it all you know what I mean? Like Yeah. I I I hate sometimes that there is two. I think it should be one sometimes, Yeah. but I knew that I didn't have the finances to be a full bike company at the time. Cause as a bike company, you had more responsibility for travel, full yeah. bikes, all that kind of stuff. So I definitely went that route. I also knew that I could work with all my riders, bike sponsors and co-sponsors. Yeah. Without it, getting in the way. Launch it. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I think I launched shadow with like 20, $30,000, I think. Interesting. You know, yeah. And I paid for all the moles that paid for the trademarking, intellectual properties, right. you know, all that kind of stuff, you know? So, so it was the big difference from UGP, which was 500 bucks. Yeah. For real. With, you yeah. Know, but it's still a very low amount of money. Yeah. Did you, know? you, did you end up selling UGP? I get one of the yeah. questions that people are asking is, is UGP ever going to come back? Well, it's kind of crazy, man. Like, I got, I get approached by this factory from Malaysia in, I don't even know what year it was. It was 99, 2000, something like that. And they wanted to buy UGP. And at the time I was having such a hard time because basically we became the farm league for Fox racing. All of our riders, they would get to a certain amazing level. And I was like stoked for them because they're going to make money, you know, yeah. so Fox will pick them up. It was one variable of it. And I knew that I was like, yeah, I need some money if I'm going to actually complete, compete in the clothing arena, going from a BMX company with a BMX focus outside. Yeah. So I made a pros and cons list and through it, I knew that there was a chance that this could not work out correctly. Shadow was two years old at the time and not big enough to live on its own, but I didn't sell Shadow. I didn't sell Sparkies. I only sold UGP to this factory. And honestly, man, like it was crazy, man. Like I sold it to them and I would start going to their new office, which was weird. They got like a, re uh, a, a really expensive location. And I was one day I go to their office and they're like, 
hey, we're going to fire the team. Like, you can't fire the team. I know some of these dudes have been with me for like 10 years. I was like, yeah. And then I come in the next day and they're buying Herman Miller furniture, which I love Herman Miller furniture. But at the time, we're like, hey, you can't be talking about firing people and buying expensive furniture, which he could sit on boxes if he had to. Yeah, for you real. I mean? So honestly, at that time, I'm the kind of person I won't do anything solely for the sake of money yeah and i had to, i had to take a deep breath and i could have milked it i could have easily stayed on made easy money not done shit but that's not me and i quit and it was insane because then i had to go back but to reality it was like oh shit shadow's not big enough and it's crazy if you go back and look at the first t-shirt collection it's like the most angry teach like skeletons cut heads off like skinless women that have like stripper hands with dollars you're talking about shadow off. right yeah yeah like, okay all that yeah. collection and go back and look at that collection yeah it was gnarly you know like super gnarly you know oh, and i love it it's still one of my favorite collections that we've ever done because it was each shirt was was shocking and challenging people to think yeah in a way and again tying back into the conspiracy in time kind of back into what UGP was always about. UGP was always about a message, you know, and yeah. and stuff like that. So I love that. Um, and so are you designing the shirts for Shadow? Then? Yeah. Like the yeah, like I, is that where the the rage from what you're seeing UGP happen inspires the, you know, the imagery on Shadow? Is that what you're saying right it, now? It definitely definitely was. At that time, I've always had art directors. So, you know, there was Chip Riggs or Sean Bartels or Evan Parker. Mm -hmm. You know, we have Arno Moller. We've had, you know, many different, you know, Jason Richardson. We've had many different art directors love within them. our company. Yeah. They're all great people, and I love them. At that time, it might have been, it might have been Chip or Evan assisting me with the concepts. But I was definitely up until probably the past four, four or five years. I'm probably less of the creative director anymore and more overall higher level. Right. But back yeah. then, I was definitely. In the trenches. If I wasn't physically, yeah. I was definitely directing every aspect. You nice. Know? That's dope. Uh, from, from a creative standpoint, you know, it's like, but it's also from a manufacturing standpoint. I was always right there too. Yeah. You know? So now it seems like we started the conversation with the big, the origins of UGP, and now we've gone back in time and we're kind of at that that meeting point. Let's start with like, I guess uh, you, you got your OG shadow team and what's the what are the steps that t that it takes to grow a company like shadow and you know what were the growing pains what did you learn in the first couple of years of doing it like where does where's where's the money coming from you know you invest 30 grand but where's the money coming back to you in what form like what's what's the highest margin product and what what was important and what were you guys doing man it it was it was an extremely unique time that I had no clue that I was entering into because I wasn't the first to go over to Taiwan. You know, like I think Volume and Federal might have been one of the first kind of core brands to go over, and through them, I think Moeller Moeller might have been one of the or We the People was the first, I believe, and Volume and then Federal and then S and M and then I learned through those guys. Oh shit, you can go over here. So. Um, the thing that was back then, it was just a really unique time. Like it wasn't difficult. It wasn't easy, but it wasn't as difficult as it is the past decade. You know, huh. like it's definitely a lot harder. Cause you know, you could show up in Taiwan back then jokingly with 20 grand and start a company. You probably need a hundred, hundred and something thousand now to, to start a company okay. over there, you know? So back then I, what, what ignorance is bliss right you know <laughs> like it was didn't really money came from basically from us honestly i mean back then it was get in the van drive fly do talk good thing was is we already had the structure because initially when let me back up way back okay. i was at a point in the very very beginning that shadow was either gonna be a shoe brand or a parts company huh. and i was because i love shoes and yeah. i went to china i studied shoe manufacturing i learned i know exactly how to make shoes i made a couple shoes before i sold ugp and then they made some shoes afterwards but i made a couple so i learned i realized that it was a bad idea because first off it was like the amount of shoe sizes colors designs skews bike shops don't sell shoes bikes just sell bike parts so i kind of yeah. was like you know what let's go this route this makes more sense and it's it was you know i love shoes it's more of the passion so again everything i do in life i try to kind of 
Pros balance and cons. out. I don't, yeah. I don't try to go in and say, here it is. I always try to have both sides of the coin, figure it out, and then go down the right path. So it became a parts company. And then the good thing about doing that was it already had the worldwide distribution channels because of UGP. Okay, dope. So it definitely made it more plausible, not easy, but more plausible to kind yeah. of- I'm trying to know, picture worldwide distribution channels in 2002 and 2003 without, I guess it's like, cause it's not automated through the internet like it is now, no. but it's, it's just phone taxes. calls and yeah. Emails, emails were, were going off then. So it was emails, Fact, social media wasn't really there yet at all. Barely. At all. I think MySpace might have existed mm -hmm. or Friendster or something it, at that point. MySpace, yeah, Friendster and MySpace definitely did a little while into it. Yeah. You know, and it started, especially MySpace. I remember like, you know, about how cool get all, get, all, get your flair going on your page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, so the kind of going into that, that was really where it, like, I can't really speak on what was hard or not because it was, it, it almost just seemed like it just, the concept just kept flowing and growing, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, okay, here it is. And a big thing for us with Shadow was when Byron had the idea for the interlock chain, which was groundbreaking for chains, you yes. know? And, and that was our second year of business. And honestly, that's our, today, that's still our hero product. That's our okay, gotcha. number yeah. one product. It's definitely the product that changed the market. It still leads, even though there's lots of imitations, it's still stronger and better than than those. You know, yep. that was really hard because I went to every <clears throat> every major major chain manufacturer and asked them, and they're like, "Nah, you don't need this in your life. We don't huh. need this. Not happening." And I finally found one factory, whom is still the factory we use, and they only make our chain. So nice. No one else is made there, and they said yes. So that was amazing. You know, that is amazing because, because I feel like many brands yeah i think as a brand you should have you should bring something to the table that's vibe based and bring something that's technically based and you're okay. not really a company in my opinion unless you have these meaning us bring like seats and bring that kind of that's vibe street fashion is vibe yeah. and watching plus many other things we've done are <clears throat> technically yeah you know? and i think that's really really important from a brand standpoint because you always got to think about what are you bringing to the table? There's many variables. There's not just two, but those are the two that I tried to, to yeah. focus on, you know, I love and that. I still apply that same logic to everything I do. You right. know, it's like, it has to have the objective. The thing we talk all the time, we're starting. So I was like, well, what is the objective? What is the purpose? Why? Right. And if you can answer that within a reasonable short amount of time, then it's probably a good idea to go to the next phase. Yeah. You know, but kind of going back yeah, the, so kind of like what was hard and not, I mean, it all was freaking hard, especially in 20, 21 years, 20 years ago, when I went over to Taiwan, I had this trading company that the guy just loved to party. And I was like, I like partying too. You know what I mean? This is fun. Yeah. You know? But when you're traveling 24 hours door to door to get someplace and I get over there and I'm the kind of person, if I go to a new country, I will do anything you tell me. I'll eat anything you put in front of me. I'll get wickedly drunk to eat it. You know, but I'll yeah. do whatever you say. Well, this guy was taking me to all these hotels and these bars that I was like, what the fuck's going on? Like you'd pull up to the, the hotel and it was like a gate and you go in and then every hotel room had a garage door. And I was like, that's weird. So you pull in the garage door, go down, you go upstairs and every TV had porn on it, like dildos and whatnot. Well, come to find out, they're all the love motels. And I'm like, and then they take these things called KTVs, which are basically karaoke bars. Yeah. But they're essentially brothels. Whoa. So all these women would be there. And I'm like, I'm not into this. I'm like, this is fucking weird, man. And you would just, they would just get you so drunk. And they would just be drinking, 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 drinking. You know, and it was just, I was like, what the hell? Is going on in this <laughs> I'm doing this for day, Shadow. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And the next day, you're just like, oh my God, I'm trying to walk in and talk yeah. about something. And then when I met Stephen Liu, he actually started taking me to all these places. I was like, oh my God, Taiwan is amazing it is it is a great country great people that's a bucket awesome. list place i want to go you have yeah. to because it's such a cool place but it is one of those things like with traveling you're like okay i'll do whatever till i figure it out and as years went on i was like nah man i ain't going there i ain't drinking <laughs> <laughs> i keep telling us he's now you want to party dude you fly to my house and i'll get you wasted yeah you for know? real <laughs> like, well, a great time you know yeah. but 
you pay for the plane ticket, you know? <laughs> but it was crazy because you would just be like, oh my God, it was just the weirdest, weirdest scenarios that you would just be in, you know? But yeah. those are probably some of the hardest things, just trying to learn how to communicate, you know? How to do and, business. Like, and be a, dude, you'd have to like play games, culture. you know, because especially there, like, I'm so laid back and I'm, I don't like getting mad. I do everything in my power not to be mad. Yeah. You know, always suppress it. But I'd have to pretend like I was mad and like slam the, the thing and I would leave and then just go walk on a walk, read and my just, phone, yeah. and stuff, <laughs> and come back and sit <laughs> down and act like <laughs> I was pissed, but I, I, that's not the way I, I I'd rather communicate it. Right. You, know, you'd have you to can put a poker like face that. on, but you have to do that over. That's interesting. A lot you of emotion to, in business in Taiwan. In, in just old school mentalities, they don't respect you unless you. Unless you have, outbra- <laughs> unless you have yeah. outbreaks, you know. Yeah, and I'm not into that at all. Yeah. I hate that style. What about like, because um, I've heard in different cultures, like it's not right to just go straight into business. You're like required to chit chat yeah. for 15 minutes like there's an actual like amount of time that you have to just be talking about the weather or your wives or whatever is did you run into that at all i mean good thing is for me i like starting every conversation in that manner yeah so it never really bothered me you know but it it is weird because you can't you you have to be very careful about being extremely direct like with japanese like you can't go to a japanese person figuratively speak and tell them you're doing something wrong you have to kind of come underneath and kind of say, Hey, how's this? Cause that's not how that culture works. Like yeah. American or English, English is awesome. Cause that's why it's the language of business. I mean, the British made, thank God we we're lucky enough to be in an English speaking language, but yeah. it's not our language. The British, they're the ones that made it the language of business by traveling around colonizing the whole oh, world. Oh, true. Yeah. Yeah. And they brought it everywhere. The good thing about English is it's direct. I remember one time we were in a meeting and it's early on, there was a bolt with a washer. All we wanted was the washer to come off, and that was it. Like 30 minutes into it, and I remember I was just like, Take the washer off, man. I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, we're Byron and I was our deal or Byron and I were sitting there, and we were like, we're like, they don't even fucking talk about the washer, they're talking about going to KTV or something, you know. Like, you know but literally, with with in Mandarin, they're not very direct. You know, what I've learned is the points in the middle you discuss around it. Till I think I'm not those technically till someone assumes what the person's trying to state. Wow. Is what it feels yeah. Like. And it's so it is careful. You can't be so direct. That's know? interesting. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm wickedly direct. Yeah. I don't like I don't like gray area and I don't like dancing too much. Right. You know. So I'm like, yeah. hey. So it is a fine line, you know. So did you learn everything, like, as far as, you know, negotiating and being in business, did you learn everything just by doing, or did you read any books? And if you did read any books about sales or negotiating, what kind of, what, what's, what's an example that you would want? Or if, if a young kid's interested in starting a business, what's a good book for, for them to get started? Man, I would have been a good, I mean, on my bookshelf back here, you know, I've got yeah. the, Phil Knight Shoe Dog book, which I highly suggest. Reading. What is it? Phil Knight Shoe Dog. Oh, it's Phil Knight Shoe Dog. Phil, Phil started um, Nike. Um, That's dope. That sounds like a good book. I should read that. Um, God, there's so many. I'm trying to think. But it's in the past, it was all life lessons. Right. You know, I can still remember when I started UGP. And one of the, when UGP became actually really successful is when I started making number plates. And actually, I'll jump back one quick thing. I'll go to what I was about to talk about is like when I started that, I, I was ordering the plastic and I had to go to the plastic place and I get there. And I remember the guy, I'm talking to the guy and he ordered the wrong plastic. It had a grain on it. It wasn't a matte satin finish. And I'm talking to him and the guy looks at me and he goes, don't cry over spilt milk. And I'm like 17 at the time. My dad's with me. And I'm like, I was just so young. I was like, what the fuck do I say? Fast forward like five years or eight years later, I stopped doing business with the guy as soon. I was like, fuck that guy. You know, yeah. I was like, fast forward later, the guy comes to me and he goes, I want your business. I saw it, the screen printer, you're doing this, this, and this. And this was one of my first lessons I taught myself. I was like, oh yeah, what deal can you give me? And make it the lowest deal you can possibly make it. I've never, I don't really do business in this way. So then I I took it, went back to the people who I really like. They beat that price. And then I went back to the guy and said, 
do it. You got to beat it. So he made it even lower. And then I bought it from him. I said, Hey man, I'll just let you know, you said this thing at 17. I'll never do business with you again, but thanks for the deal. <laughs> I, have, you know, I was like, don't cry ever spilled milk. Bitch. But it's, it's my life lesson I took out of that is always respect everyone in front of you because you never know who they might be in the future. You yeah. know, and not who someone's going to be. That shouldn't be the deciding factor. It should be like treat people good because that's how Just you want to be treated. For the sake of doing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, so yeah, from there, then fast forward before I get to the, the number play part is that um, I had 1988, my mom and dad drove me and Willie to the NBL Grands in Louisville, Kentucky. I went there, they dropped me off or in the back seat. I was like riveting Velcro to the number plates. I get to this place. We had a tent. My parents left. They left us there. We're like 17 or whatever. And I had a tent and I met Alan Foster. Nice. And then Alan Foster introduced me to Brian Foster and I met Jason Lonegran. I met I met basically everyone. Then I met a gentleman named Charlie Danishek. Fucking coolest guy ever. He was one who started DK. No and shit. Okay. Cycles, which was the best distribution company. And I didn't understand what even a distributor was at the time. Right. Yeah. I met Charlie and Charlie actually you know, had number plates with no bags, no headers, zip ties taped on the back of the number plate. And I was like, here's what I'm doing. And he saw what I was trying to do. But that gentleman helped me so much because, A, he helped me start making real income. Yeah. The second thing he taught me was he started educating me on packaging and how it works and why and how. And then even today, yeah. one of my number one things I'm into is how something's presented. And I really stayed a lot that came from him. Yep. I yeah, think, that yeah, thing, that was one, that's one noticeable thing that I, I love about Sparky's shadows, the Rosa, everything, the one thing that comes to mind is the coffin that the chain comes in. Like that's yeah. beautiful. <clears throat> anyway, sorry to interrupt. Go on. That was a cool packaging too idea because when we did those coffins, we're like, how do you use the same material, the same printing process, everything? We didn't have the idea of the coffin. It came through going, how do we make a box that's different with the same exact materials? And that packaging was the first box I've ever seen someone actually keep. Yeah. Keep it on their For desk, real. Which is really yeah. cool. You know, it's like, um, so packaging, oh, and through meeting then, Charlie. yeah, me and Charlie, and then through Charlie, I met Alice Bixler, which Alice Bixler was um, the Florida State Commissioner for Racing, okay. and Alice gave me 1989, my, my, my senior year of high school, I got to do the Florida State plate, which was like, like 1,500 number plates or something. Wow, like that. yeah. So, but through them, I got to end up doing, because she was, everyone loved her, I love her still today, she still, she was the one that those two people gave me my chance, you know, That's great. but through her, I got to do Pennsylvania, Michigan, Indiana, and something else. And that was that basically I walked into my job in 12th grade, I quit and I never have had a job someplace else ever again. You know? Good for you, man. Kind of a launch into, you know? Yeah. Well, let's stick on that. The, the original through Alice getting the deal to yep. produce the number plates for all the Florida racers. What does that look like? Is that you at that point? It's you individually doing it, maybe with Willie yeah. helping, or just... Willie was a part of everything since day one. GL Greg Lanthorn, our product director, he's been. I, he was the first pro, which we'll talk about. That he was my first USA pro I ever sponsored. Nice. And I met him at fourteen. Sponsored him probably around sixteen, and Sick. he still works with us. You know, so yeah. um, at that time it was just me in my bedroom. And I subcontracted out the number plates and things like that. I was printing my t-shirts in the garage, but I didn't know how to print plastic yet until okay. I learned how to do that. But I, yeah, that's, so that's what I was doing it then. It was just, just me, Man. you know, it's funny. Like, there's so many like old school racers, like Dylan Clayton, Dr. Smooth or Paul Roberts or Dale Holmes or like all these guys. I remember we all, or even all the base guys like Robbie Morales, Enos Colombo, you know, the, like all the base dudes, they all stayed at my house. They all saw UGP from the, the get like go. Bedroom, yeah. you know? And That's stuff, dope. Really, and I still keep in touch with these dudes. I mean, the base yeah. thing's kind of cool because arguably, I could be wrong on this, but I'm kind of positive that we, base and UGP, I believe did the first ever in any industry brand to brand collaboration. Skateboarding, whatnot, et cetera. You know, yeah. 
that was when I was you born. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I mean, it was crazy. Cause that trip that we did that on, Robbie, Eno's, 20 people stayed at my house. And my 20, people. Just, 20 people. 20 <laughs> people. We had my VW Buzz, Brooke Manthak, but she still rides too. Brooke was fixing my, my, my VW Buzz. And we're all in my garage printing T-shirts. Everyone's sleeping on the counters, like under the mm. kitchen tables, whatnot, yes. et cetera. And it's cool. Like Robbie, me, all of us, we're all still super super tight you know yeah that's that would be my next question just thinking about you have a relationship with robbie i saw yeah. i was just looking you up on youtube to see what was out there and i brant brant Moore did yeah. a little interview with you guys at i think swamp fest or something last year and that's cool that you guys have that do you like and i i imagine because there's not that many bmx companies distributors and i it could be competitive since it's a small slice of a small pie, but like, what do you, what, how would you describe your relationship with all the other company owners? And is it friendly or is it competitive? Are you guys collaborating? And like, do you guys share what you're working on or is it kind of just like cordial? What, what's the relationships like? I mean, any of the guys that have been around for as long as I have, I'm really good friends with, you know, like Harry from We to People Week made things or Stu Dawkins from seventies you know, federal, et cetera, um, you know, Moeller, Rob, Robbie, like, I mean, just yeah. go, I mean, everyone is cool. Obviously there is competition, but I don't, I don't believe, I don't look at competition. We most people believe in competition. I compete against myself. I don't really look at what other, I mean, I'm aware, hundred percent aware, you right. know, but I, I just don't really look at that kind of stuff in that way, man. I mean, I like when I see someone, another brand doing something good, I'm like, fuck yeah, I can do something fucking good. You yes, know, like, and it's, that's the right attitude. That's the way I look at it. And and I love competition, you know what I mean? Yeah. It comes from the racing days and whatnot and things like that. You yeah. Know? It's like, but it's, but yeah, I'm, I'm real cool. Like when I go to different countries, I, you know, hell, it's just in Germany, you know, and I was, I would have seen Harry, but he was out, he was out of the country, you know, like, yeah. so it's, you know, so yeah, I try to, I like to be as cool with everyone as I possibly can. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, and life's better that way. It's, you know? And dude, it's, it's a passion driven industry. At the end of the day in BMX or any industry, really, you'll have a high, someone else have a low, they'll have a high and you'll have a low. Right. You know, it's really all about the average of the journey. And that's yep. all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have the best time I can over the longest time. I'm trying to make the best stuff I can over the longest time. I do zero in my life. I don't even want to, I don't even want friends for short term. If I'm going to spend the time explaining myself to someone, that's a lot of energy. I'm yep. not going to do it just so I can know this person for a minute. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's, I mean, hell, ha like, a, I mean, of the 17 people or whatever is that work at Sparky's, I mean, probably six of them have worked there for over 20 years. Yeah. That's that. You know? It felt like a, like a long, it felt like an old family working there. Yeah. And even just the process of getting involved with you guys when I, I, I pestered sure with emails for like six months. <laughs> like, hey, you still you still looking for a videographer? And then I I think the the final straw was I took uh, some initiative and made a video of a premiere at Gordy's bike shop, and you you saw that I took that initiative, and then uh -huh. you guys gave me a chance and pulled and but it, that's not it. You didn't get the job yet, Bob. So you got to come out and check out and see if you vibe with all of us, and then go on uh -huh. this trip to Atlanta. The Sabrosa and Atlanta video is my tryout video to see if I got the job, dude. Well, so much so, fun. <laughs> yeah, man. It really was. It was. It was a special period of my life. Like, I still, like, I get to go on my whole life now and say that I got my dream job. Like, by the time I was 22, yeah. I accomplished enough to say, like, this is literally my dream job and I got it. So that's that feels good. So thanks for that. And, I, and I, I'm always stoked on that stuff, too. I love when people have a a segment of life, a part of Sparky's, and they go on to do massively cool stuff. And then I want Sparky's to be that place, that like opportunity center, you know, yeah. people are actually like, okay, we're here, we're doing this. And then, and my goal is always, even if someone moves on as a rider or an employee, I want to be cool with that. It doesn't always work that way, but I want it to be that. You know yeah, what I mean? like, exactly. You know, cause each, each journey, each experience is a part, a layer of like who we are becoming, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, you it's know, interesting. You know, but it's kind of one of the things too is like when you kind of go back to number plates and whatnot, like in those early years, I did probably one of the very first jumping contest series. It was called the Flying Circus. Cool. And I don't know if it was the first one or not, but it was arguably one of the first. I, I did three stops, Daytona Beach, 
Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, and Louisville, Kentucky. Flying and Circus? We, Flying Monkey yeah. Circus? Is that what you called it? It was just called the Flying Circus. The Flying Circus. Okay. DGP had the monkey head. That was like an early icon of, no. you know, from the very, very, very beginning, you know, like how and we this had is just a dirt jump game. contest, a freestyle yeah. jumping it, contest. It wasn't, it's funny looking back because we, we had to use the jumps already there, like the first straight in Louisville, Kentucky, which was not a good jump. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it was a, it was a jumping contest series, you know, a lot of dudes, you know, like Taj, that's how I met Taj was at Sick. Louisville, you know, I saw him riding, I was like, holy fuck, I got <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He wrote for Albie, that was his only sponsor at the time. And then Legend. he became the sponsor. But I've always been a big proponent that if you're going to take, you must give. And that's our business model. Yeah. You know? So we're going to make money. So, you know, we did the Flying Circus, we did Roots Jam for eight years. It was 300 riders in three days and then flatland through park yeah dude roots you know? is pretty legendary and it was i bad. i do want to talk about that let's stick on roots for a second oh. i mean how did it come up it's so i think it's so embedded in like a lot of mid school slash old school even younger kids maybe they know of the roots jams yeah how did it originate and yeah tell me the story of the roots well jam. the story was is like ugp was a disruptor at racing, you know, like, so every race we go to, we always try to do something kind of crazy. It's more outfits. Like we had like mechanics outfits, all tan with like, you know, their names written on them, patches and because everyone has fancy uniforms and whatnot, or we did military uniforms and whatnot. No. But then that started leading to, we did a military tent in a whole booth. And I found a, I found this place that did um, movie um, props. And I knew the guy worked because I got all this movie prop stuff for a military booth. Then we did a Hawaiian booth with hula girls and whatnot and Hawaiian outfits. Then we did, like, Ryan sure has a great story on this one, is we did a catfish shack. We all dressed up as hillbillies, and we were drinking Southern Comfort and getting all crazy. Hell yeah, Ryan brother. A great, dude, he's got a great story <laughs> of, like, coming into there. And then that was our last – then we decided, you know, like, hey, man, we've been doing this for a minute, man. Like, every because every race we'd all go to as a group, we'd go to wherever state it was. And as soon as race was over with, we'd all go find the local ditch, pools, trails, et cetera, go ride it. So everyone was in town. So I went and got like a couple ramps that I just bought from people, like two quarter pies, a box jump. And we went to the original outspoken bike shop in Longwood, which is the first real core shop in Longwood, which is Mike Cottle, the calls are, Mike Cottle still, I'm going next week to see Cottle, you know, in Sick. Pittsburgh, the welcome jam. Yeah. Um, but yes, we did it there, and that was the first one. And we did it, and we're like, man, it wasn't, it wasn't anything crazy. I mean, it, and that's one thing I always tell people is, do something with what you have, not with what you don't have. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, just doing is really powerful. For real. You know? so, yeah. So we did that one, and it was so much fun, man. There's video footage out there, it's rad. You can see like, you know, like Corey Nastasio, like launching the spine ramp to flat ground, and Sick. like all this kind of shit. It was really, really fun. I remember that one, all of a sudden this truck drives up with a long trailer and a whole band on the trailer with a ski mask on and they just start raging metal. Sick. And then they played a song and then they left. We still have no clue who they were. <laughs> what the fuck? You know, so we, that Roots Jam. A drive-by metal show and then get the fuck out? That's amazing. <laughs> so that, that Roots Jam, basically we stopped doing fun stuff at the race. And then the following year, we went to this parking lot on the same road that the race was on. Okay. Near, more near downtown. That was the second one. That was pretty fun. We had a car and I'm a standard dude. So like they were hacking with an atch and like Pete Augustin was there and like Sean Albright passed out because it was so fucking hot, you know? And, then, <laughs> yeah. and that must have been 99, I think. And then I found about the fairgrounds and I went and rented the fairgrounds and had the two pavilions we had a middle section. You know, we would go out there and like all the Boston crew, like Steve, you know, Mark Raina, Sean, um, dude, uh, John from uh, Skidmark Ramps. Like we were all just, we would go there and just sleep at the fairgrounds and build ramps all night for a well, week. Sounds like Swamp Fest. I mean, lot cleaner and nothing burning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is, but I mean, is, the, mean, is the location fairgrounds? That sounds like where I've, I've heard of a swamp fest being. Is that true? It, no, it wasn't there, but that's still where the, um, the Orlando BMX track is. Okay, got gotcha. you. It's been in two locations yeah. since the same spot. 
And that's why we did it there because the race, it'd be Easter weekend, so the race was going on and we did that there. So it was, that was fun, man. Yeah, Having dude. That. And, and Roots, just the fact that you like started it, why, so why is it called Roots, first of all? Because everything again was really corporate at the time and it was like X Games was going and whatnot. And we wanted to offer a competition, but relax. Because everything that was competition based is uh, like robot, yeah. right? Intense. You know? So right. our idea was like, don't paint the ramps, leave them all wood color, but put logos on it, so, whatnot. Yeah. And it was really hard, man, because it would cost about $30,000, 30 something thousand dollars back then to put on the event as we went through it. And we'd only charge each sponsor about $1,500 to sponsor it. And, and we would have to paint all those logos. We hand cut the stencils of everyone's logos, paint them on it build all the ramps. Then I start getting to the point I started learning about like renting empty semi trailers. So we start putting all the ramps and trailers and taking away out the Kissimmee, parking them for the whole year and bringing it back to buy okay. more wood. And yeah. it kept, it kept getting. So by the eighth year on the eighth year, it was awesome. I looked around and I was like, this is so fucking rad. It's so it's fucking rad. I was like, it's done. I don't, I wanted to end it on a on high, high point and 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 it's cool because I think it was the right decision because I still get monthly messages saying, "Oh, bring bring, bring roots, roots back." back. Bring yeah, roots back. I'm like, yep. "Well, give me a sugar water sponsor, and I we can definitely bring it back." <laughs> <laughs> you say sugar you know? water sponsor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the only way to pull it off. Shoes, shoes, and 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 energy drinks are really the only way to get yeah you know, capital to put on an event like that. It's just for it's real. Just, so what's crazy. how would you so some somebody listening who's a kid in a local scene and wants to put on a, a jam or an event, what's the what's your what's your advice? Like how what's you know, to I, other than just do it with what you have, what what how would you go about if you're if you weren't who you are right now, if you yeah. just starting from the bottom, how what's the process to get a get a, get a decent jam going? What would you tell well, somebody to do? The thing is everyone thinks to do a jam, you gotta give away free stuff. It's like, stop all the free stuff and make it about the, the presence. Be there, be aware, be a part of a community. I like that. And let, stop making everything instantaneously. Things don't have to be big. Make it small and personal. Make it 10 people, then make it 20 people, then make it 200 people. Like yeah. Make things fun and chill. And again, going back, do with what you have. You know, everyone's like, I have nothing. I, I mean, look at Candyland in Longwood. It's a prefab park that's created some phenomenal riders, and it is nothing. Nothing. That <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But again, it's the thing that's cool about BMX, especially modern BMX. Like when modern street riding came in, nib jib, you could take a curb to a gap to a a, a, a sidewalk, and that's a spot now. You yeah. know what I mean? That's phenomenal. Like you can make. I mean, watching Chase Dehart ride yeah. and the way he can take anything and make it look sick as fuck. Cool. Yeah. Also, too, the thing is, I'm kind of going off the contest thing, like Simone, you know, yeah. to me, he's, I'll go back to the contest thing, but Simone's yeah. another dude that it looks plausible. You could be as good as him, but you can't. You can't. But the cool thing <laughs> is, is, is it looks like you could when you yeah. watch him ride. And that's important, I think, in BMX. When you're all sitting there pushing evil can evil too much, you're like, I can't do that. Exactly. You it's know? unrelatable. I agree. And Simone like, is so well, so tech. He makes it look so simple that you're like, oh, I, can, I should go try that. And then you go try it and you're, <laughs> you get humbled. <laughs> I don't know how he does. It's magical, uh, man. Some of the, I have, to, I mean, most of the shit I have to watch three times to understand what he did. Like, uh, that his like. Slow mo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just like repeat it over and over. It's like, hold on, wait, he did what? With, with, with which peg and what foot? That's yeah, so cool. Man. You know? yeah. But honestly, I think, honestly, one of the things I really want to talk about today too was is we as a community need to take control. We're mm -hmm. really bad in BMX about not controlling the message or the environment. We got to go to the, the local community um, meetings, get the skate parks on the street plazas, whatever. Put on events, man. Like, doesn't matter like have a high air contest have a bunny op contest like right. don't give prizes make 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 trophies out of garbage do whatever yeah. you know what I mean? like 
but everyone needs to stop making it about what am I going to get? Yeah. How am I going to get sponsored? Like, stop all that. Like, start thinking about how am I going to laugh? How am I going to create a lifelong friend? What memories am I going to leave with this? How do I like get inspired? You know, because inspiration does typically doesn't come with you locked in a closet. It's being around other people that are like-minded that are going to help you improve yep. your outlook and your perception, you know, and it's, and I think local events, if you don't control the local, how do we ever control the world yeah, for being for real. And, and we are like terrible as a community. We constantly are, you know, behind the eight ball or whatever the right wording is. You yeah. know what I mean? And I'm like, come on, man. Like, so yeah, I, I honestly think it's like nowadays, if you got Instagram, make a flyer. It could be text. Who gives a fuck? You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't have to be anything. Don't, don't, don't ask everyone for a, Five hundred with a free product that yeah. now you're gonna put the local bike shop out of business because everyone gets free product. Yeah, you know what I mean. And that's happened with a couple of shops. You know, they give away so much that they went out of business because of their local events. Shit. You know. And, yeah. But but dude, the thing is, is things can be simple, man. It can be a Subrosa street rail and have a a, a game of a game of bike, you right? Know, a game of rail or whatever. You know what yeah. I mean? It it doesn't have to be insane. But the one thing is we do need to get more involved. We have to get more involved with our local government. We have to put on more events that are ours. I agree with know, that. And not others. I think I went to one hearing um, a, at, at a government building about a skate park thing, and it was so dry and, like, you just sit and wait for a long time. But you got to do it. Like, that's the slow-moving bureaucracy that – that here in Arizona for like my when I first got into it 16 years ago the skate parks were like brutally anti-bike like you couldn't ride your bike in a skate park for like more than a second without the cops coming and there's a bunch of protests and it's since loosened up a lot which is really nice but like yeah. just like shit like that you have to yeah. go through the process of like going and getting involved and so the I mean skateboarding yeah. I mean skateboarding is our big brother you know, yeah. like people are like, oh, BMX. It's like, look, it doesn't copy skateboarding. It's honestly, BMX and skateboarding were created essentially in the same bowl in Venice. Yeah. Those dudes, the dog town, they rode BMX bikes there, skated, rode them in there, and then left out. Yeah. Oh, boys, or even like World Industries. World Industries, skateboarding, and Bully Bikes shared the same warehouse. Huh. And Bully Bikes and World Industries became the biggest skateboarding company in the Interesting. world. Interesting. Mark McKee was the art, the artist for World and Bully. So all the original Bully graphics were all done by Mark McKee. No Mark shit. McKee and Sean Cliver were the main artists for all World Industries, and he did all the craziest, gnarliest graphics. And he's a BMXer. Huh. So that's like, I mean, yeah, you're, so what you're saying about like Big Brett, literally Big Brother. Like, we're related. They, BMX yeah. and skateboarding are. I mean, Spike Jones, Jeff Tremaine, Jeff Tremaine, Jackass. Spike Jones, obviously, everyone knows Spike Jones. Jeff Tremaine, yeah. Jackass, whatnot. You know, Mark Lumen's part of. Um, oh my God, I'm having a brain fart. Um, at AMC in Portland, Oregon, I'm having a brain fart there. But Mark Lumen's gone on. I mean, like all these dudes, they're phenomenal people. They've gone and do really great stuff, and that's all. All skateboarding and BMX yeah. was right there. We're just really bad as a group about becoming a collective and working together for an outcome, you know? Right. And, it, and it's something hopefully the newer school, I mean, government bureaucracy, I'm not very good at, but one thing I have learned just like anything, go to the meetings, find out people's names and befriend the people in charge. And that's yes. what I've been trying to do with the different cities is I just been trying to find the couple people, I get their emails and I, I send them emails sometimes just to say hi. They're nice. like, what the fuck, you know what yeah. I mean? But I, I try to send different things. I try to keep in touch because hopefully as we all know once you're in a subconscious you can't be in the conscious mind also you right know? and that's and that's one of the things i think we as a bmx do a terrible job <laughs> yeah what do you think is missing like you say we're doing a terrible job what could we do better and if we did it better what would what would be the result like what what's in your head for the future of bmx well, if i knew what we we're doing totally wrong i would do it differently i'm not yeah. sure either you know i think maybe we're all just very um I think we all might be more quiet and reserved as a group than maybe others. Skateboarding, maybe one thing we've wondered about is their their mentors were surfing, and surfing was a lot more advanced than skateboarding. And so maybe there was some 
Interesting. I, you yeah. Know, I don't know. You know, I'm mean, not sure. You know? Yeah. What was the second part of that question? What do you think the future of BMX looks like? I mean, I mean that's another wide question. Awesome, <laughs> as far as the action of. Yes. You know, agreed. but we we definitely. I mean, street riding is only going to get harder and harder and harder with the cities are so wise now. You yeah. know, so they're not building classes, new spots really. It sucks. Sometimes you're like, man, are those architects, are they actually skaters and BMXers and being dicks? Because yeah. shit's getting completely different than like the, the architects from the 70s and 80s that For were like, real. oh my God, you can session this and, you know, and things like that. But it's, um, I mean, the thing is, is it's because the awareness in action sports has gotten so popular that, you know, going to different spots, it just gets harder and harder and harder, man. And yeah. You know, so I think having more street plazas, more avenues, more compounds, you know, I mean, the compound thing you see a lot of people doing with their, you know, their yards and whatnot, buying properties. Right. That's pretty cool, man. But that that's cool. Singular. That doesn't really necessarily help the whole, whole community. Yeah. You know, yeah. And stuff. But I mean, I don't know. It's a really good question. And I'm, I'm hoping there's someone out there that can like. You know, I was talking to Ditch Matt one time and I was like, hey, man, I wonder if this would be plausible. Can we go to a city, have Ditch or have, have Matt, someone go in and go and sue them, sue the city for not allowing bikes in? Because, you know, what's a law. Once you have a case study that shows proof of a win, it then can become normalized to all the other. Right. Yeah. It sets precedent. You know? And then boom. Now, yeah. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if that's even a. a but Ditch idea. Matt is a lawyer. So you're talking but to the right was, guy. And he, was, yeah. he didn't tell me to fuck off. He's like, oh, man, interesting. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. and so we were trying to get all the, the industry people to say, hey, let's all pitch in some money and then let's all buy a lot or someone. And then would this. Now, I never really went past like probably a couple beer talk conversation. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. But man, because the thing is right now, it's really unfortunate that. A government can use your tax dollars and tell you you're not allowed to use yeah. the facility. That is insane to me. It's double you using know? the tax dollars to build the skate park and then to pay the police officer to kick you out of it. It's so it's crazy, insane. dude. Yeah. How is that even? I mean, I always wonder, like, who all these new riders of work? Their dads, like their moms, like someone has to be. Yeah, for real. Up, they can yeah. do this because <laughs> I don't like this thought because it's kind of coming in from a negative point. But at this point, I'm like, damn, BMX needs. BMX is amazing, man. And like, and, and the fact that you can ride a BMX, one of the things I think we're missing too in BMX, I love BMX. I love flatland, I love trails, I love street, I love park, I love transition. Yes. The singular aspect of I'm only street or I'm only this. Right, I get yeah. it. But it's a little bizarre to me in some ways because, and I know when everyone's giving everyone shit for like landing in grass or gravel, I'm like, I'm laughing yeah, in my that's mind. Because I'm like, I'm like, that's one of the things I love because you could go ride a rail. Exactly. That's, that's the benefit like, oh, of a yeah. bike. That's what skaters all say. They're all, dude, you can land anywhere. And that's the <laughs> that's the cool part of it. Yeah, I think we're, I we're all that. over that shit with the hating on people landing in grass. I think I think as, <laughs> as a community, I speak for everybody. You can land in grass now. <laughs> you know, Rodeo your peanuts dead. <laughs> it's approved. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> So, but that is one of the things that's super cool about that. I know on the, the conversation on the opposite, keeps all different kinds of directions. Oh yeah, it's chaos. But on the opposite of, because you just said you love it all, but let me pose this question to you. If you had to pick one discipline to either watch or do with out of the five core disciplines of BMX, like dirt jumping, park riding, flatland, or street, which, which one are you picking? Man, that's a tough one. Because... That is a tough question. And I, I don't want to necessarily answer completely because then it kind of goes into well, whom do you want to watch each one? But to me, my answer would be it depends on who's writing each discipline. True. You know? Yeah. So like with, with transition, flow and steez is just everything, right? Yeah, dude. You know? and, yeah. And, then, and even with trails, you know, or flatly and like speed, like, you know, like speed and, and the faster a flatliner rides, the better it is. Yeah. Like, you know? You know, so, cool. so it's, you know, but I mean, but for me, I grew up in the time period that you got a bike and I would ride to the track. I would race. I would then go to the trails. I would go ride the skate park. I go ride ditches with one bike. Yep. And that's one of the things I've loved um, since um, Matias pretty much brought back the double diamond. Frame yeah. From Flatland. And I'm really glad that he brought that back. Wait, what do you mean double diamond frame? 
What does that mean? More traditional, more of a, okay. they call it a double dime when the front is a normal looking frame. Just, instead of like yeah. Down so he's doing flat land thing. instead of one of the weird frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And he was one of the ones. And now that is kind of not the normal, but more the trend, in my opinion, the bike looks way more. I mean, yeah. Seppel, the guy Seppel from Coons Form, he's one of the, he's the founder of Coons Form Mail Order. He's a flatlander and yeah. he he does sick line. He does street lines with flatland tricks. That I love that. And does line and dude, he goes to water, what and does he, dude, he does like up rails to hang fives. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that, to me, when you talk about flatland, I'm like, that's what I like. You know, I'm noticing like, something about like the convergence of street and flatland to where like if you land a flatland trick and you like stomp your pedals when you land instead of doing the like flatland because in flatland rules it's different as long as you roll away like if you, you have one foot over here and the other foot's off it's cool but like the, now there's a I've seen a lot of smooth ass flatlanders who are doing crazy tricks but then ending with a bunny hop tail whip and stomping it on the pedals like it's so it's so good that is yes that is sick i mean it's the first a, time i ever saw a bunny hop tail whip i was like impossible yeah you know but honestly flatland i mean street just like skateboarding going from freestyle to street bmx went from flatland to street and now street yep. is a heavy dose of flatland oh yeah big time you know? that's like hang fives and manuals and all, all that came from flatland Man, I haven't even touched my notes with you, Ronnie. This has been natural a breeze. Um, it's fun, Tom. I know I kind of I have a tendency of kind of going we're all, wide. Yeah, we're all over the place. Back, you know, it's like it's you know. Well, what's something else you want? So we we film? touched on the future of Sparkies. Uh, yep. So 2023, we're getting involved in just traveling and seeing people, and you're you're in, you're in the process of planning that out. We talked about your overall business. Um, what's been your favorite era of BMX? Because you've you've been through, you know, I mean, you're 95 years old, so you've seen a lot, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> What's been your favorite like decade or time period of BMX? I mean, all 40 years or 30 years of riding, absolutely my favorite. But I would obviously say probably the beginning because everything was new and shocking. Yeah. Before internet and magazines and yep. the unknown. That was still awesome. I could see that. You know, I would probably say the BS series was probably the nineties when we go to like scrap in Chicago or the last BS series that Daytona stone edge. That's right. When it turned into um, X games right after that. Okay. And that's a year that like the whole, um, what does BS stand for? Bicycle stunt series, Matt okay. Hoffman's like the gotcha. CFBs, BS, it was, it was CFBs and BS. It was either the BS series or C. I always forget which one was which, but yeah. that window is my favorite because it was, we would all started traveling a lot as early twenties and we all went all over the country like we did for race, but now it was for freestyle. freestyle that's dope. Really, really, really fun. I always remember the house from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, like Taj, Cody, Joe Rich, like um Lucky. They all live in a house called the Thunderdome. The Thunderdome. And remember, yeah, and it was really cool. And I remember they all every every event they all entered in bowl ver why not they would only play the 138 song <laughs> yeah, we all, we all, play it. i still can remember yeah. you know and it's yeah. like and i still remember that trip too because we, we, you know it was just it was an exciting time for freestyle in a sense because it before that it was like afa or it was the american freestyle association or it was like other types of events and then yeah. that kind of brought in that okay this is actually a series and we'll do this and then just just go hang out everywhere you know That's like it was it was pretty cool so i would but honestly really what it says every every new year is is as cool because it's 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 evolving and there's new yeah. people new outlooks new perceptions new ways of riding new and it's amazing that you can take a tool and in every couple of years make the tool perform in a completely different way for real yeah. and just the, pro the progression of like with the internet especially and the instantaneous like oh shit that trick's possible and then you go out and practice it and just looking at josh dub the way he rides like oh, his yeah. being influenced from you know the aiken to chase oh, hawk i'm right. sure and all that and just like josh dub is a modern day so that's a fun one let's go through the 
the disciplines and you just, without thinking about it, give me the first name that comes to mind, Flatland. Mark Marcus, Marcus from um, South America lives in Orlando. Sick, Mark, okay. Mark Street. I mean, to be unbiased, I won't mention my own crew. Okay. So Felix. Felix is fucking sick. All right. Dirt jumping. Mark Batosny. Nice. Uh, Park. I love to say Rim, but he's part of my crew. So I don't want to say. <laughs> you can say part of your crew, my... dude. It's fine. I mean, I love my crew. So it'd be easy to yeah, say. Yeah, your crew I think who I would say in Park right now. Chris Fox. Nice. And then Nitro Circus. The funny thing is, I'm not very in tune with that space. To be Me honest. neither. I just know Ryan Williams, basically. Yeah, there, I, I know uh, of a lot of those dudes. I really don't know that space at all. Yeah. I, I think that covers it. Did I cover all the uh, the genres? Flatland? Yeah. Street I mean, third, I'd love to go through and just mention all my crew, but I hate when yeah. I don't want to be... Yeah, so if Shout like this out. is like your uh, this is a fun one. Who's your favorite child? You know, but for your crew, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a tough one. You know, it's like it's like man, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it never man. looks good, does it? Once you say does, it, <laughs> does the future? So as far as like future of Sparky's team wise, is there going to be? Are we keeping it tight? Are we expanding the team in twenty twenty three? What's what's going on? Plan I mean, we're team wise, trying to add new dudes into the you know. The flow, then am, then pro. You know, our pro team is still the same, same yeah. guys, which is you know, which I is love them all. Awesome, yeah. yeah, great dudes. You know, I mean, like, I mean, all these guys, like Simone, I've known since he was fifteen. I've known Trey since he was nine. I've known like um, Matt Ray. I've known since he was fourteen. Yeah. Jerry, he's one of the newest guys I've met, but I've never met a dude that's weirder and funnier. Than he's Jerry. so cool. Yeah, I've never <laughs> met him in person, but you can just tell, like. Yidi. He is a character. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, a crazy like Russian Bell character. Is he Russian? No, he's Czech. Czech. Okay. But, yeah. yeah. Same. But it's that, all over there. That Baltic state. The Baltic state humor is really, really funny. Man. I love that. It's yeah. Different, different. It's one of my favorite places to go. Is going like we did a shadow trip to Russia. Yeah, like you did. Ten years ago, and that was that was we were the first team, I believe, to go there. Yeah, and it was wild. I, mean, you know, <laughs> I believe it. I mean, speaking of that, like when we started Shadow, we we're like, man, how do we do a trip that no one's ever done? So we drove from Florida to Austin, Austin all the way to Mexico City, and then all the way back. Wow, it was nuts, man. I we we're driving at one point in the middle of the desert, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, rah, lights go on. Ryan Shirt's driving. I've been drinking like. I'm a six pack in or something, probably just hanging out, drinking in the desert. I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden there, the guy in front of us was, was Mexican. He said something we made it through. I don't know what happened. We Whoa. went in Mexico city. We went to this rave and we're all hanging out and we're like, man, that smoke machine. We go around the smoke machine asking any of the guys was a fucking car engine pushing exhaust fumes into the building no <laughs> Where are you? then we went to this crazy skate park that was insane that had spines that were like 12 feet tall like there were spines everywhere like you'd pop up and you didn't know if there was gonna be a spine or not you know what i mean <laughs> yeah but it was in a shanty town the entire literally miles were just houses made of just garbage and this multi-million dollar skate park we were the first people to get to ride it Weird. And we went in there. It was a wild. It was yeah, a wild trip. That is wild. You know? Come to find out, we were going through Laredo at the border of Texas, and come to find out way later on that that is the the drug trafficking the sketchiest main. way to go in. Yeah, possible. <laughs> we had, and that was before. I don't even think we had cell phones then or any of that stuff. So it was. No. Anyways, again, that's the beauty of getting in the car, and that's kind of one of the things I foresee right now. Is I do think twenty twenty three is going to be extremely difficult for every segment of business, not just cycling. Just business. But one of the beauties yeah. of something like that happening is, again, going back, do with what you have, not what you don't. Everyone's going to get back in vans, get back in cars, stay at people's yeah. houses. We're all going to start traveling more like the 90s. And yeah, it is fun doing the exotic stuff and doing this, but honestly, getting in the road and just going is really cool. Man. Agreed. It's a really good way to get to know people. And for the past three years, 
I don't hung out with anyone, you know. What yeah. I mean? You know, so so I think twenty twenty three is gonna be like get get in the fucking van and go see shit, man, and start filming and making cool shit. And I think that's yes. what and positivity, man. Everyone needs to stay positive. Yeah, get in the fucking van. <laughs> you know what? So you mentioned you mentioned filming. I'm curious about the importance because I think about this often. I'm like, what is the importance of having a full time videographer on staff at a BMX company at this point in time? It's like. I mean, I, if I'm, I put myself in the shoes of being the owner like you, it's just like, I'm not sure if it's worth it to pay somebody a big salary to be the videographer for the team. Like it's, you know, it's a, what are your thoughts on having I think it's, my job I think, existing? <laughs> I think if then. finances were stronger, it's imperative to have a videographer on staff. Yeah. Unfortunately, finances in BMX are not great for that. You know I mean? Mm -hmm. Probably. I could be wrong on this, but I think the only staff videographer right now might be Stu at SM Fit. You know, yeah, maybe. I think you know, you're probably not wrong. It's all, wrong it's all like that, project I, based and uh, contracted out. I think. I think it's something we we as an industry we need that actually. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like we've we've been blessed to like for people like you and Chadwick and even Kip Williamson way back in the day and many other phenomenal videographers but it's we right now don't have a, a set person you know? yeah you know but it's i think it's imperative but it's at the moment it's just not gonna happen you know for a while yeah. so like for in your case i would imagine like if you have a team trip planned you just like contract a filmer to come out and do it or if you're going to somewhere where there is a filmer you can hire them to do it and True. that's interesting I, th I think that would be dude it's so it's so interesting trying to put myself in the shoes of a like bmx company owner like what yeah. what's a what's the what's so we, your hero product for shadow has yep. was and always is the the chain what's the hero product for sabrosa or a general bmx company i mean for 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 sabrosa obviously it'd be like the the rail the street rail phenomenal. i mean we invented yeah. something we brought something it's to pretty fucking that sick helped everyone. i was there you know, at the beginning of that that was rad a little wild process you yeah. know and you know that rail was really really difficult because you had to start with what they call dimensional weight which is your width times height times width and the shipping companies all do dimensional where they calculate and have a percentage and then says hey it, yeah this might weigh 40 pounds but this because of dimensional weight it might weigh figure speaking 70 pounds huh. is the way they look at it so we had to start that project off with dimensional weight as our main objective because we knew we needed to ship in one box but then you had to go you needed strength and you needed box size so yes. that was a really wild because when people engineering look at it, problem that's that's interesting and yeah moving thicknesses, weight whatnot the whole process was a really interesting because people had made breakable legs before to their detachable legs but no one ever made a, a a rail that came apart in the middle yeah ever and we yeah. were the first now you see like california's ramps copied ours yeah you know blah, you blah, made something blah. good you know you yeah know? and that's fine i'm i'm i mean it sucks right you love to have a little longer to make a little more money happen before <laughs> everyone but that's the nature of of it's not just a site a bmx thing it's every industry does that right you know like yeah and you know, so it's just it is what it is. But I mean, um, yeah. As far as that, I think those are two major. So for Sabrosa, the rail, and that's kind of unique to Sabrosa since you guys brought that to market. But like other BM, like in general, a BMX or a frame or a, out, is it complete bikes that is the biggest margin and like the breadwinner no, for? No, BM, BMX bikes are quite tough, man. I mean, you might make 30, 30 15 points internationally to maybe 40 points maybe on domestic with selling to a shop maybe and huh. then once you start giving free shipping what does that mean counts. points points is like um, um margin okay you gotcha. know, like hey yeah percentage of margin percent. yeah. yeah okay gotcha you know so, so how much margin you can make and obviously you need margin so you can do road trips and you can do things yes and, and all this stuff so it, it's funny because bmx is always the thing that i was like making money was bad making money is not bad is how you use the money exactly. is good or bad yeah and i always said proponent that if you make money if you give if you, you take, can do dumb give, shit you know and yeah so yeah so bikes are extremely hard and right now the market is going to be so flooded on bikes that it's no one's going to make any money on bikes for 
at least till damn 25. that's a shame you know? yeah, yeah it is. it's it's really really crazy you know and stuff so it's, what are your thoughts on selling videos again like i, I oh. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think physical DVDs are going to be distributed anytime soon, but the I think there's potential to in this new new internet age to I don't know, sell a video for 5 bucks and see how it does and like I I'm I'm very curious about that. Like maybe there's a I think it's insane that that's even a question for someone to do I spend 5 bucks or not spend 5 bucks. Right. Yeah. You know but I don't know if it's gonna be plausible. I'll be like Twitter right now, trying to charge eight bucks a month for yeah. a check mark. Exactly. Everyone's like, what the fuck do you want? You want me to, you've been giving it to me for free for how long and now you wanna charge me? Yes. So I don't know how it would work in a bigger scale. You know what I mean? Yeah. But Have you thought about like me? maybe the shadow club, you know, and you join, have you considered something like that? And then just kind of like, ah, eh, it's not, that's not really gonna. I think about a lot because back in the day, club homeboy, which was Spike, Andy, um, Andy Jenkins, Mark Lumen, they started to call club homeboy and you could become a member. They send you a zine. You get a hospital band that says club homeboy on Sick. it. You would get discounts and whatnot. And you get stickers that showed you can only get them if you're through that. That's interesting. But yeah. Back then there was a lot less noise, a lot less things for you to spend your money on. So I don't know if people look at things in that way. Right. You know, it's like, but I, I like that idea and I like the idea of, of being a part of, I mean, and I love exclusives. I love things that are limited edition. I love things that are, yes. you know, I can probably see half the toys. I don't think you can see them enough, but half the toys I have on my shelf back here, all just limited edition toys and things yeah. that I collect on my trips. But I, I don't know, man. I, we were just talking, I mean, I was I chat, like Trey on when you interviewed Trey, you guys talked a lot about like the, um, the no fun video and, yeah, doing all that kind of stuff or anything like that. And I think that's really cool because I like his and Chowick's perception was, well, this is a good way for the videographer to make some kind yes. of money out of this yeah. or just trying to spread the, the cost within a bigger food chain. So then everyone can actually pull this off. Like yeah. And the burden isn't channel. on just on just you to fund yeah. the whole project. That's yeah, I agree. Well, when we used to sell videos, you know, a road trip used to cost, not even that long ago, like you could do like, figly speaking, not exact numbers, like 1500 bucks. You can do a road trip with a couple people. Yeah. It's like five, 10 grand now to do yeah. a road trip. It ain't cheap. People. Yeah. No. And it's, it's almost at a point now that you're like, oh shit, that's almost too expensive. Yeah. You know? I, I know that your guys' model or our model was yep. bringing uh, a, it, one trip a year with you bring in all the international riders yeah. and we'd spend 10 days in Albuquerque or Vegas. And then we so have all the money. assets for marketing, for photography, for video yeah. and all, all that shit. Like, is that, do you think going to keep going forward or is that not it's, feasible it, cost wise? It's going to be that, but with less people. Yeah. It's got, yeah. And do and probably do it more like, okay, this, one of the things I'm really proud of with our brands is we are literally an international riders. All our team is from all over the world. Yeah. They're not just from Longwood, Florida. They're everywhere, which is beautiful and extremely difficult. But it's yes. one of our objectives that we want is we want our brand to speak in every language, you know, yeah. meaning not literally, you know what I mean? But like, we want the vibe to be all these different elements. Because so when you look at our brands, each brand has a very distinctive look. Like say for shadow example, we also have Simone's vibe, Trey's vibe, Matt's vibe, Jerry's vibe, et cetera, within the overall compass of a yeah. brand. Because one of the things I hate as people or branding is I hate when people or a brand pop, 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 pop to the flavor of the month. Yeah. I'm not into that. How you, how do you, cause I'm a, I'm a super fan of the things I like. Yeah. And if they start, if they're metal one day and then hip hop, then this and that and whatnot, and you're like, and they're into the newest icon or trend or filter or whatever it's like you know Ugh, like yeah. it's really about it's i always say that if in 20 years now i'm a completely different person i failed if 20 years now i'm the same exact person i failed, failed. yeah after the incremental evolution and that's everything so video people teams that is the way i perceive life i like that being. yeah and i tie that same thought into videos evolutions and kind of going back to your going back to your beginning question is I think it's going to be us jumping in cars, vans. We're going to hit regions. We're going to hit spots. We're going to show people again, kind of how 
to make the most with the least. And that's yeah. really what I think 2023 and 2024 has to be. The the action of BMX is better than it's ever fucking been, man. And I believe BMX has grown. That's an industry thing everyone's kind of talking about is like, we know for a fact it grew. The question is how much did it grow and how much can the industry retain in the new fans? Yep. You know, how many of those new fans will be around in three years? You yeah. Know? And then how will they look at it? Because that is kind of the trend. You get into it around, you know, 15 or 16. And then by the time you're 18, you get a car and you're over it. That's kind of the yeah. path for a lot of people, which is interesting. And just like a total side tangent, when I'm, yeah. when you think about, being a BMX, your target audience isn't us cool core no. 20, 29 year olds. You're marketing to 10 year olds who are going to maybe 10, 13 year olds to get their parents to buy them a, a bike or whatever. You know, it's it's interesting. I, I don't know. I find the business side of it so intriguing. I'm like, I, I don't envy you. I don't want to be in your shoes where you have to <laughs> manage all this you know, shit. And, it, it, but. You're conscious. You're conscious of your different consumer niches mm -hmm. but ultimately you're not designing for your friends and you're not your friends don't buy shit they get it all free from you yeah you know exactly I mean? yeah. as a designer it's you've got to be conscious to listen to what your friends are saying but know that it's they're not always correct yeah. you know and they're not your consumer either yep. so it is a very very you have to make money so you can make the shit you want. Yeah, exactly. And it is a balance of like, okay, yeah, I might make this one shirt that's not my favorite, but I made these three other shirts that are I'm fucking exactly. So funny, you know, yeah. and that's, you know, that's you know, for me, I want the smallest logo possible. You know what I mean? it's like, <laughs> for real, same know. here. I, I don't. I wear zero logos at, at, for the most but part. That doesn't sell. Correct. Big yeah. Logo because guys are defined by the crews or the brands they rock. Yeah, that's how guys are like girls. They can go to like and get trend based purchases. They can get fake shoes, fake clothing, fake everything because it's all based on a trend. They get fast fashion. They yeah. can get, they can buy anything. Look hot, look good. No one cares. Guys, if you showed up wearing some kooky ass thing and it wouldn't define who you're down for. And that's guys, you know. Yeah. So it is an interesting thing how guys look at stuff. You know, it's speaking like speaking of um lost not lost leaders, but like just products that you have a passion for. What is is there something right now that's not making money, but it's you're still selling it because you love it so much? Like I, I think I, I, like how is the combat lock doing if it's still still doing? And is there yeah. any product that you have that you're like, I don't even care that it's losing money. I love this product that that much. I mean, absolutely yes. I'm trying to think of what that is. It's like, I mean, I love the locks. That's not my passion by any means. I, I love the fact that when I realized that no one in history of BMX had ever made a lock by a BMX brand, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, yeah. okay, cool. So the lock thing was interesting because we went for the, le the, the path that most people wouldn't go for, which was a low security lock. Yeah. So the objective planning was wickedly fun and trying to think about like how do you do this in this way and take a different approach you know but things that i mean honestly clothing is probably that you know what i mean clothing mm -hmm. is not we do good we sell the zoomies and union and all these different places we've sold to that's dope you sold the zoomies one, so you yeah, can buy shadow shit at the mall yeah not probably more in our online okay but still though in the mall, that's dope you know yeah but again it's cool because again that's the steps we all make as I mean, Colt sold the Zoomies and a few others. And I think it's it's an important thing to get the awareness out. But clothing-wise, kind of go back to it. I just love making clothing and designing it because yeah. our products are cold function metal. They're not, you know, they don't really speak in the same way like an article of clothing does. Right. So yeah. clothing to me is the way we present vibe in visuals of the technology and the innovation that we put in the products. Sick. So for me, I'm really, really into clothing. Obviously, it's my my it's my hobby within the brand you that's know? your that's your passion and, and it probably yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense doing it because it does take a lot of work you know what I mean? yeah but it we feel super important as a way to kind of express express you got our to. Vibes, yeah you know? exactly and, and stuff so it's always really fun in that sense you know yeah i um, think you're interesting because you i think that you get a kick out of 
business and I know you're passionate about BMX, but I think at the same time, like you're just as passionate about the art of business and like creating well, something. And I, I learned a long time ago, I do not consider myself a businessman. In all honesty, I'm not. I just realized very early on that I like creating. And if I wanted to create, I had to figure out how to create profit, how yeah. to make sales and structure. And I'm a person too that I hate gray area. I hate, we, at work, we always, we joke about this. We have a, a spot on the ground that there's tape, a bucket goes there and the mop hangs above it. We always say, make sure it's on the fucking peg and on that space because I don't want to talk about where it is. I just want to grab it and do it and put it back. Yeah. And that's the way I look at business. Organize all the stupid bullshit stuff that I technically hate, but it's imperative if you want to make this cool yeah. X, Y, or Z. Yes. And that, that is me. And I, I honestly, like if I could not do any business tomorrow and I could only do creative direction and creative aspects, I would be really happy. I believe it. <laughs> you know, <that's> like, <laughs> I think. I'd be super happy. That's one know? thing that I remember from time out there at Sparky's is I, I haven't been to all of the distribution centers in BMX, but I would bet that yours is the one of the tightest ships like just systematized everything, like you said, but where the mock, where the bucket and the mop goes, it's that, it's that same type of, um, just uh, cut the bullshit out yeah, of it, you know? Just, it's, it's, that, it, it's just a, a system and every, this goes there and this goes there and this goes there. And it's, it was very eye opening and cool to learn for, for the time that I was out there. It was pretty neat. Never talk about it again. Let's just talk about the shit that's fun. Like, let's talk about roads, yeah. let's talk about products. Let's talk about these things because those are difficult conversations, you know. Right. What I mean? And 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 I do think that that is I I businesses business is fun, but it also does suck. Yeah, of course. It's you like know, you quit I, quit your job so you can work for yourself, and now you work twenty four seven. That's what it, that's the way it works, right? You yeah. know, you're just like, now you're just working. I, dude, I, mean, I learned that with videos so hard. I was like, okay, I'm going to quit this, <laughs> quit this job and then work not my, for, for my own company. And then I'm like, yeah. oh shit, I'm working 12 hour days, like seven days a week. This is, sucks. I mean, the beauty <laughs> of it when it is, is it, as long as it's something you love, yeah. it does help. It doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make it better. Right. It does. I mean, I get to work at, you know, I'm at work by 6 a.m. Yeah. And I work till three, then I go to the gym, work out for a couple hours and I go home and then, and then that's, that's what Turn I Turn it all do, off. You know I mean? Good for you. Yeah. yeah you, know? you look good, so man. It's, it's trying, man. I yeah. mean, the one thing is you can't control getting, can't control getting old, but you can control getting fat. Yeah, you really can. <laughs> you know? Are you doing, you're weightlifting? I do mostly like, um, burst exercises, a lot of stair set running, lots of running, lots of like planks cool. and first yeah. exercise type vibes and stuff like that that's so, what's up i've been doing I that it's just funny man because it's like as you get older i realize like you know you you start to lose balance yeah so i don't ever want to lose balance i'm not to that point yet right you know yeah. i still love doing everything i do but it's but honestly i there's nothing worse than just allowing yourself just to completely fall apart yeah for real i i'm gonna, I'm gonna fight my bikes. i'm gonna fight mortality as hard as i can i one of the things i think i I've learned is like weightlifting supposedly like strengthens your bones and stops slows aging. Same with yeah. like intermittent fasting and a uh, low inflammatory diet and all that shit. So that's, that's stuff. Oh, do you cold plunge and sauna and all that? Are you on that I, biohacking type I, shit? I'm fine. I love the cold plunge stuff. We're actually talking about making one. Yeah. You know? So I'm really into like, I drink 144, 140 something ounces of water a day. Good for you. you no, know, I have two, two big, a big jug, man. I just drink shit tons of water, man. And, and then honestly, just trying to, I love beer, mm -hmm. but I, I'm trying to change that to not doing it too much, you know? Yeah. But honestly, it's funny, man. We were kids. I remember we used to make fun of people for stretching. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't remember ever drinking water. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we didn't have a hose, but I'm like, when did we ever drink water? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I wish. I'm jealous of people now because someone that's 19 or 20 now can have this, this information. Right. And now you could ride your bike for even longer. Yeah. If you just stay, if we, if we stretched half the motherfuckers wouldn't have gotten hurt. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you like, know. you know. You seen that Gary funny. Young video that just came out? Speaking of longevity, dude, it's so fucked. It's so yeah, cool. He is. You wouldn't even be able to tell. Like, it's funny. I think of Gary Young, I still look at him. I still think of Gary as a Dirt Brothers. Yeah. You know, like, his <laughs> yeah. original sponsor was on Dirt Brothers. I yeah. Still, and he's still just killing it. Amazing. He's got to be one of the most longevity. Brian Foster comes to mind. Who do you think is the longest in the game, but still killing? It? It's got to be Gary, right? I mean, Foster's got to be one of the oldest. Yeah. At, at that level, I mean, Greg Lanthorn's in his mid fifties, and he's he rides fixed gears, mountain bikes, races BMX, no. bikes park the street. I'm like, you know, um, I mean, I don't think there's anyone in the world that loves BMX more than GL. Sick. You know. Yeah. But honestly, when I was a kid. I thought life ended at 25. Same. When I was in high school, I thought I was in. We used to say that guy. Every time a dude was 25, so we're like, that guy. Yeah, you know? exactly. And then, and then I'm like, holy shit, I'm double the age of that guy now. <laughs> yeah. You know? But when I, when we were kids, no one, no one rode BMX till they were that age. You know? Like, our generation, like, Moeller and I were, like, kind of the first guys that really started ride our own brands coming out of the 80s. Interesting. You know? yeah. And before that, it was always owned by dads that were businessmen that would be into it and pop in. As soon as it dropped, they were, they were gone. And yeah. that's why in that late 80s, that early 92 was probably the darkest period that huh. we've been in our adulthood of BMX. You Interesting. Know? And now it's actually, now it was more business run back then. And now BMX is more passion run, which has its problems too. You right. know, because I remember a few years ago, I'd be at the trade shows and I'd hear different business owners. They're like, yeah, my, in the conversation it would come up. Oh, my wife has a great, a great job. I'm like, oh, fuck. So your shitty brand is now funded by your wife's job. <laughs> and not because yeah. it's actually a good brand. But the point being is, is that it's, um, it's passion. Yeah. And that's the beauty of BMX is that it, it, it teaches us all so much, you know, yep. but it's, but the health thing is, I think something that I think, BMX needs to push more on. Yeah. You know, and I think there is a, is, it's, it's a good trend going around and there's a lot of good examples. Like the higher, higher level dudes are showing like Nathan Williams, he's showing, he's stretching Corey Martinez and DeMarcus does a good job. Chad Curley is promoting weightlifting and Matt Ray is actually a really good example yeah. of just like it's CrossFit, you know, it's cross training yeah. type shit, which is important. <clears throat> I think it, and Matt and I, Matt Ray and I talk about it all the time. You know, we're always comparing nose, trying to figure out what we're doing, trying to figure out the, yeah. Cause honestly, especially coming out of COVID and mental health, exercising and drinking a lot of water really helps people's mental health. And I'm, yeah, I'm kind of hoping that more people will kind of start looking at things in this way and think if I, if I don't eat these processed foods and I start eating more things that are not in boxes and I start yeah. drinking lots of water. Dude, I'll feel a little off, be a little stressed. I'll just drink a fuck ton of water. I swear to God, I incrementally start feeling better. Yeah, you know? it's magic. It, yeah, it really, we are water. We need water. <laughs> but how is it that, you know what I yeah. mean? It's like I'm fascinated by because I drink tap water and whatnot. I'm always conspiracy theories. I'm like, man, is that fluoride in the water a real thing? Yeah. You know? Dude, <laughs> if, it, it, really if it is, I don't care. I, I'm using <laughs> fluoride toothpaste, but... And, <laughs> And you want me to stop using deodorant? No, thank you. But I, there, there might be some truth to all that shit. I, I definitely I limit like deodorant. It's like there is things, you know, the yeah. metals and whatnot that are in and it. Your but skin I'm not is deodorant. your largest organ, and it absorbs all those crazy things. And blah 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 blah. You've heard it all. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not pulling like Jerice and yeah. And they're all pulling the, 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 the hippie stick. Yeah, the, the hip, and, the uh, weird bristle tooth. Was, it's like a stick. That he brushes insane. his teeth with, and he doesn't wear I mean, deodorant. I don't know. I, I haven't seen him in a minute, so. I respect it all, you know what I mean? But I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm, I like him. <laughs> I love you. I love Juries. Hopefully he's watching this. Hi, Stinky Joe. Oh, I love, love Juries. I can't wait to see him, man. It's like, that's another thing. It just kind of just feels like everything's just, everything's virtual based. I can't wait for it to Yeah, actually it is virtual based. Back, you know, it's like, it's, you know, but I mean, I think a big thing kind of, you know, I, I just hope everyone realizes in BMX that we're all on the same, we're all in the same van and yep. we want everyone to have a good time, you know? And I think it's just really important that everyone just respects people's differences and enjoys them, embraces them, make yeah. them better. You know, it's like, Agreed. Whack, there's been lots of wacky style riding 
and there's been lots of very refined and beautiful pristine writing i love it all mixed together you know who's so. your favorite wacky writer i'm gonna go through and i'm gonna find our, our questions from the, the audience but yeah who's your favorite wacky writer probably jeff harrington nice you know, always two yeah. different shoes half yep. haircuts whatnot <laughs> you know what i mean you that know? is indeed wacky really nice dude, and he always had a way of looking at it but god there's actually other people i'm having a brain fart there's other dudes i love how they look at objects i'll think about it that's always hard yeah. when you're eric Elstran, mike mastroni my goofy yeah. my goofy I, I don't know they're not even goofy they're just creative and awesome they, right. they have a very yeah different but oh god what's this let's see <laughs> i like this one jonah you know jonah ja Chan. Yeah. if you had, if you had a time machine to give your younger self any advice what age and would you go to and what would you say that's that's a cool question thanks jonah one of the life lessons I think I've learned is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Sometimes self-editing, sometimes doing something only because you, because I used to have the philosophy, I can, so I will. Yeah. And I would just do crazy things, projects, whatnot. And I think sometimes self-editing and sometimes the logic of less is more, not just in design, but sometimes in projects, life, yeah, expansion things like that. Less, so I, like, I agree. That's a good because one. you can doesn't mean you should. You know. All right, Sparky's France says say bonjour Yee! from France. Oh, bonjour, motherfucker. Bonjour, Max Vu. Shout out to Max Vu. Uh, will we be? He says, will we be seeing UGP again? And uh, we covered that. We will not. I wish. I wish. We got Maybe all the him and his dad constantly get some old UGP archives that are so cool. That's man. sick. Yeah. They're doing yeah. it. What's the shop called that they have? Um, Epic. Epic. Dope. Yeah. yeah. Epic. And they're in I West like them. I believe, you know, it's, yeah, they're awesome. Foo's awesome. Foo's crazy. I love yeah. it. <laughs> that's, that's the dad's name is Foo? Yeah, he's awesome. Foo Yeah. Um, yeah, and Max coming in, is coming into his own, like that video that just came out, like oh, good. killing it. Watching yeah. him grow up and, you know, change from just being on a little kid's bike to where he's at now is pretty sick. And he's so well-rounded. So well the, the youth is the future, man. All right, big boy Dustin Arp, you know him Ooh. from uh, Denver. How often do people think your last name is Boner? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's so funny, man? When I was in high school, they, the class actually started UGP, and the teacher said my name like that, and I looked at him, <laughs> and he was cross-eyed. And I go, ha, 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 that's not funny, your face. <laughs> and I had to stay in the front office for like two weeks. <laughs> Uh, wrong boner <laughs> i'll take it whatever yeah, it's, it's got to come with the, the last name that's funny right? all right so ditch frank uh, any plans Please. for any plans for trips we kind of talked about you're figuring that out right now I want to come out and see those motherfuckers mm -hmm. I love the, that crew. he says videos video plans and any new riders on the horizon yes to all above and yes to all the above yes. anything you can say about new riders coming along no, I think we'll see. Yeah. Okay, I we'll keep it keep cool. it low key. Yeah. Yep. Dope. Uh, let's see. How the interlock came to be. That was Byron Anderson's concept, man. Byron Byron's phenomenal. He is so fucking smart, and he's designed all of our products. We all collectively work together. You know, like GL and I work a lot with the factories, making it happen, stuff like that. But Byron. Byron had that idea, man, and it was it was a good one, man. It's it a damn good idea. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It was, was it so, a million dollar idea yet? It's gotta be. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. You know. But it's um it's it's interesting because when you look at it, you're like, I think the best ideas created are the ones that you go, that's obvious or it's so obvious, but if it was, someone else would have done it. And I think right. that's usually when the best things in a market are, because they look obvious. Agreed. Yeah. And that one comes from Anaximander Hinan. Hell of a name. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this one I think I can answer for you. Daniel X. Paul says, would you ever consider doing another Roots Jam? No. We ended yeah. on a high note. You know, let somebody I mean, else carry the total. I would absolutely do Roots Jam if someone would just put up the fun name because I think it'd be really needed right now in 2023, 2024 for BMX. Yeah. But unfortunately, BMX could not 
it couldn't fund it. It would have yeah. to be funded, you know, with some sugar so tell water. Him to find us that sugar water money and we'll do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. We Moto B says what happened to UGP. We kind of, we covered that. Don't worry about yeah. that. See yeah. somebody else. Brad just says, will you bring back UGP? Everybody loves yeah. UGP. Brad. All right. Let's see. Francis Castro. When did you decide yeah. to be the nicest dude in the world? As soon as I met him, <laughs> Francis is awesome, man. He is, He's a man. Good dude. He just moved to Longwood. Yeah, no shit. Sick. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, Jerice says, "What's up?" Yeah, we, Jerice. What do you know? We were just talking about you, Joko. All right. Robin Sloot says, "What are the top three most important aspects to longevity in the BMX industry?" probably touched on a lot of the points through this. And I mean, obviously don't do anything for money, only money, because it, if you only for money, it will, it will end fast. Yeah. You know, um, be conservative always with views and finances. Um, and take risk, man. Cause if you don't, if you don't put your ass on the line, you know, one thing I talk about time is being a pro rider is exactly the same as being a business owner. And with a pro rider, you know, you have to take risks. You have to put yourself out there. You have to promote yourself. You have to do all these things. And with be in business, you're doing the same thing. You're always putting yourself out there. You're always taking major risks. You're going to fail. Sometimes you're going to, you might, you might try something and fail five times before right. it actually works. And I always talk to the riders that like, look, when you think about being a pro, think about it, not as a business, but it's the same property, same elements, you know, yes. of it. You know? And if and you it, stop getting better, you stop to be good. You, yeah. that, he who stops getting better ceases to be good. It's something that my dad used to say. And I think that I applies think, yeah. to both business and writing. I think so. And it, if, if you're not learning new tricks, at least you're like applying your take. So like Simone, for example, I think he's still learning new tricks, but oh, he, yeah. he can do anything. But now he's at the point where he chooses what to do on certain spots. And I love that. That's well, kinda... that's a good thing. Trey and Simone both can backflip. They both can ride all kinds right. of stuff. But that's what they, they choose to choose do. to not do it. And yeah. I've always like, at first, like, that's crazy. And I was like, that's cool, man. It is you cool. can have all these things that like, nah, yes. I'm not doing that. Exactly. You know? And the same thing in business too, because I can go and make, I mean, people are always like, you should make this, you should do this. I'm like, it doesn't fit the objective. So why would I want to do that? I, you know, as I'm yeah. not going to do that, you know, it becomes a, you become an artist at, at yeah. a certain level. All right. Chandler golden local homie who yeah. just dropped a video on dig. He's really good. <laughs> he's really good. Um, that dude's awesome. What is one of the most impactful things in BMX from your day that still stands out right now? <sighs> most impactful thing in BMX from my day. Back in riders, my day, <laughs> riders taking control. Sick. That's yeah, facts. That's, I love that's that. Definitely, yeah. That's perfect. That's I love it. Well put. All right, Tyler crying. Why is Ryan sure the best? <laughs> Dude, Ryan sure is so much fun to hang out with. He's actually texting me right now. But it's like, yeah, yeah Ryan. Ryan is Ryan is my little brother. Hell yeah! God, I love love it's crazy to think ryan sure between getting on shadow and now working with sparkies and sub rose and all that has been it's been 20 years that's awesome that's crazy cool. yeah. Yeah, and you, you said long. this is the 20th year of Sabrosa or shadow, shadow okay yeah because yeah, Any... Sabrosa started 2006 so it's getting it's getting close yeah i remember being there for the 10 years of and Sabrosa. Uh -huh. um Let's see, but yeah, that's dope. I'm sure you have cool plans for the 20th anniversary of Shadow, but we, it, it'll be a secret conspiracy until yeah. Until it, Honestly, until this it goes. this information project that we did with the Hawaiian crew that was the beginning. It's their 20, and now it's our 20th. So we nice. started it off in December as like one of our first little projects. All right, and I think that's that's a wrap from yeah. our from yeah, our questions on that. There's other ones, but. Damn, that, we, ain't, we ain't gotta worry about them <laughs> well damn dude it's been nearly three hours um we could, and we, yeah we still could keep talking <laughs> yeah for real i appreciate I you coming on you, so it's easy you know so i was excited when you when you brought it up yeah it brings back memories it's funny because i haven't really been in the mindset to want to talk in yeah. this way and i was stoked that it was you because i was like man this is 
fun. I've always enjoyed everything you've always done for us and me, and I've always appreciated it. And yeah. I, I like talking with you, man. So hopefully this doesn't sound too too insane all over the board when people listen to it. I'm, I, I think it, I always feel like the podcast is absolute batshit, but then, you know, <laughs> you get some feedback and it's like, wow, it was so cohesive and easy to listen to. And I'm like, really? Yeah. All right. Fucking hey, cool. <laughs> First of all, I'm like, thank you for listening. So, oh, yeah, thanks, amen, thanks right? everybody for listening. Um, I mean, I hope through these different podcasts, I hope people can always take a little something and make yeah. it their own, and hopefully, hopefully help. I always want to hope inspire the next group of dudes that are going to take BMX to the next level. For real, you know, and hopefully that happens. Hopefully, you know, it's like I'd you know, say I want all all the people who have any interest in starting a podcast to start a podcast you know like yeah. to, there's there's plenty to go around for everybody i don't know and it's just do exactly it's it's just that it's the rider taking control like you yeah. are you can you can do whatever you want you can throw to throw jams you can create your own youtube channel if you're into that or you know go hard on instagram like brad sims did and i yeah. mean just ride your bike and share the journey it's, it's like hide in the woods and don't talk to no one and enjoy your yeah peace, and, 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 and enjoy like, dirt jumping that seems like the dirt jumpers mo is hide in the woods <laughs> and don't, I don't talk blame to them man though, yeah you know, like, fuck everyone. there's something magical about that what is the was what do you where do you see yourself in like 10 years or when whenever you retire from work and where do you want to be and what's your uh yeah, I'm gonna what's your dream doing... When I when I step down from like AMI Sparkies, it'll be I just want to do prop my property companies, commercial property and Rocksteady. Sick. Yeah, you know, one of the things I love about doing Rocksteady is that all of our customers, I know who manufacture, I know graphic design, I know how to make anything. So when I'm speaking to different people, I can actually help them develop their products in a way that I can help yeah, them understand that's huge. In, a, in a language that they understand. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's one of the things I really love to do. So in the future, I'd love to do more of that, you know, That's great. and stuff. So, you know, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I hope in one faster, I'll always have some kind of finger or toe in BMX, but at some point it'll be, you know, time to move on to another aspect, yeah. you know what I mean? But, but I hope I never, ever too far from it, you know, yeah. it's been, been too, I don't, Hell, to think about it, I've been riding a BMX bike and been in business now longer than I wasn't. Yeah, that's you crazy know? to think about. So, that's wild when you think about <laughs> yeah. that thing. You're like, holy yeah. shit, man. It's like, it's been longer than not, you know? That's wild. I can't, I can't imagine what the BMX industry would look like without Ron Bonner, you know? Like, you've had oh. a tremendous impact and given a lot, so it's cool. I mean, in... And I appreciate you saying that, but it's not just me, right? There's right, of course. It's a very it's a good team. collective of, you know, people that have that have been going for this past twenty something years, actually thirty years. You know, that everyone's really been just so passionate yeah. about BMX, and it's, you know, which is really cool. You know, but every I mean, team needs a captain to steer the ship. Yeah, so yeah. that's what you I'm know, saying. Saying it's, it's funny to say that. I always say, hey, let's be a speedboat, not a barge. Yes. You know? I mean, let's pivot when we can, but conserve fuel. No. <laughs> <laughs> chaos. but yeah no awesome man well i appreciate you dude thanks for thanks for having me on man i can't wait to see what crazy photos you clip up and yeah we'll see we'll see what the instagram <laughs> clips look like <laughs> that's my favorite part <laughs> well, awesome, um, man. well i hope you have an awesome sunday was there anything else you wanted to talk about or the last thing the, i always ask your mount rushmore of all-time riders that's one we got a couple of questions that we'll go through so mount rushmore yeah, okay. real quick no thinking about it for four uh, riders Four? Yeah. Got Simone, Taj. God, um. God, that's hard. That's yes, it is hard. You got two. Or I got I got Taj, Simone. Um I'm trying to think way back. I mean Dave Clymer. Because he he was one of the first guys that brought punk rock into racing, and he was like he's punk rock. He'd pedal so fast, a little sketchy, and he would he was one of the first dirt jumper dudes too. So Dave Timer okay. for sure, um, and Matt Hoffman. Hell yeah, solid. Have without Matt, you know? yeah, for real. You know, that's 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 a really good Mount Rushmore, and I've never heard of the third one, Dave Clymer. I'll have to look into him. Dude, look him up from Pennsylvania. He was the first rider pro guy that I sponsored outside of Florida. 
All right. And I was cool. a big climber, you know? So it's like, so I was like, man. Dave like, Climber. Dude, look him up. He was SM writer. He was on Jason Lonegran and Dave were all on like, was it Pedal Power or they had purple, white, and black uniforms? They were so cool looking. And, Sick. And he was just so punk rock that he was one of the original POWs, Pros of Westminster. He lived in the, like, when I went out to California on my, I, I sold my car, moved out there for the whole summer in 1989, and he had a brown Astro van, and I got to ride every every iconic spot that I'd ever seen. Dope. And if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't have been in that. In that That's magical, great. You know? so, I love that. But look him up. If you can find anything about him, it'll be like, oh, I will. He's a, he's a badass. Second question. Young, young riders that you, are, that you are looking at right now that yeah. I should know about that I don't know about. Man, Jake R. Kevin, Kevin, um, Jake, Jake R. Yeah, Jake. I always pronounce Jake's last name totally. It's Jake and Jay. Jay's his dad's name, and Jake. Um, it's let me. I want to start this over. It's like, and but Jake is phenomenal. He okay. rides trails, park. He rides. He skates. He he races. He does everything, and he's so good. Or even K. Rob right now. Look at a K. Rob. You know Kevin Robinson. Kevin son. Robinson. Okay. Yeah, Kevin Robinson. So good, man. Or even Beast Margera, like Beast. Yeah, Kid, Beast Marota, right? Nate Marota. Yeah. I'm the words of pound pound school class names. <laughs> yeah. You know, I definitely failed that class in school, but it was like, um, but that's a cool thing is watching all these dudes and watching them all going from like being, you know eight, nine, 10. And now they're kind of getting up into 11, 12. Like, I think Kevin might be just turned 16. Yeah. You know, now, but it's like, they're watching all these guys, you know, like grow. And that's and the just, age where they're learning tricks, like nobody's business and progressing. Uh, and, it, and it is nuts. It's crazy uh, how like when your brain is young, you can just learn tricks and it sticks. You know? It's so crazy. Let me like, before I forget, because I might be able to say it like, oh, like maybe you can. Um, yeah, what's Jake R's Instagram? Maybe I'm the worst at it's R U T K O W I T Z J A K E. Rick Cows. Yeah. Jake Jake Rutke is on. Is, yeah, Jake. I feel bad. Rutkowitz. 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 However, his dad pronounce. Jay is an old rider, old, old rider too from Pennsylvania. Okay, dope. And he's and 13 he's years old. Dude, and he's on shadow dude. riding gear in Sabrosa or getting flowed. Yeah, yeah. Sick. So he's him, Kevin, Beast, they're all from the Northeast. And there's many other riders like this. You know, you're like even looking at Trey Jones, like he was nine when he really started kind of popping. And like Max Wu was like, you know, probably in that same yeah. a little younger, you know. And now look at all these guys, you know. They're dude, besides Beast, I hadn't heard of these two. So this is a good one. Usually people don't stump me. I'm already following. So that's that's good. <laughs> well, I wish I could have done more justice for pronouncing their last name correctly. <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the thought that counts. <laughs> but if you're looking, if you're looking for some young dudes right now that are fun to watch that actually embody what I personally love about the is just writing everything. That's what these dudes do. You know? Beautiful. I love watching it. You know, and they're just so fucking good. It's insane. For real. <laughs> and then, okay, third. Third and the last question, what is your, what are you most proud of accomplishment wise in, in your career, whether it's a writing thing or a business thing, what, what do you look back the most fondly on? You've done a bunch of great shit, but pick one. Cheesy as it may sound, it's just the memories and friendships, honestly, you know what I mean? Like it sounds cheesy, goofy, yeah. whatever, because they need to be like, this product or this right, or that yeah, yeah. or this journey, that road trip. But honestly, all of it really we strip it all the way down. It's about that. And that's honestly That's beautiful. You know, like I mean, even like I said, when I was in Germany a couple weeks ago, I I've known all these people for ever I was going, I've known everyone for 20, 30 years. That's pretty like, rad. This is yeah. Cool, you know. And we joke a little bit because I swear it's not truth, but I swear like in the nineties. It felt like you knew everyone in the world who rode a BMX bike. Yeah, I think it, it still almost, feels like that, man. We we, we have a BMX family worldwide. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's not as pure as this, but it used to be, and it still is some sense. If you still on a bike, next thing you know, you're staying at their house. Yeah, that's the way exactly. It was. Yeah, it's not as much like that now. Everyone's just like too busy going. <laughs> <you know? laughs> like, you know, but yeah. it is it is memories and friendships, man. Because Perfect. ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the only thing you can die with. You yeah. Know what I mean? 
that. Memories. So, All right. Yeah, yeah, that leads me to the last question. Just uh -oh. quick advice for young, hungry kids. And we kind of covered it already, but you mm -hmm. hit me with faint, the last words for the children. Advice for, for what? For a young, hungry kid. I don't know. A general advice, like I, don't try and get sponsored. Don't do it for money. D take control. Yeah. Do shit on your own. That's, I mean, that's kind of what we talked about already, but anything it's, else? It's, God, it's a good one, man. I always try to think it's like, it's, it's, um, if you want something to happen, put yourself in the, in the path of the momentum. If you want, I, I firm, I, I, I believe that you can will anything into place, but that doesn't mean it just happens. You yeah. literally have to, before the internet, I would, I would find artists or whatnot that I was really stoked on. And I would go to the place to make sure that I could meet that person and I'd meet them and then become friends with them. Or if I saw a ride or a spot, BMX action back in the day, I was so delusional. I just went there. Just nice. Get in, you know. And I was like, hey, "I'm Ronnie Bonner. What's up?" <laughs> I probably didn't say much. I was That's pretty badass. Nervous, yeah. but, but I do believe in kids right now. You got to believe that you you got to go the organic path versus the pushy path. Right. Do yeah. do first, and then see what comes of it. And yes. it'll be a lot. It'll be a lot fun. A lot more fun in the journey too. You know, yeah. everyone right now is so concerned with being sponsored but if you really break it down the one thing we all want in life is to be a part of something yeah not necessarily sponsored yes you know or you want to be sponsored not necessarily pro because if you're trying to shoot for pro it, okay I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an example a couple of years ago i had an intern in and i was like hey man what do you want to do in life like what, what's your goal because i want to be a cfo i'm like wait you're not getting you don't just become a cfo to become a cfo it's about the journeys and trials and tribulations and everything you do to learn to make the decisions of a cfo so as a, a writer to say i want to be pro for something kind of misses the whole point it's like you should be like i want to get in a van i want to go i want to go hang out i want to do these things i'm going to take my money instead of buying weed and beer i'm going to buy a plane ticket and i'm going to go out someplace and just see what the fuck happens yes. you know and next thing you know organically things will happen that is know? true and, yeah and i do believe if if you want and you want to will it in place you have you can't just sit at home people think organic means it just happened organic means that you're not forcing you're you still have to push yourself in front of the momentum in yep. order for it actually to turn into something for you you know and 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 i i i still do that yeah hell yeah oh, it, it, it never ends it's a I, never ending journey high school when i was in high school i remember i'd have a semester and i literally did not talk to a single person in school wouldn't talk even though i was friends with everyone i just talk, but i learned through ugp that if i wanted things to happen i had to put myself out there so i constantly i'm a very shy person by nature but i realized that if you're i said if you don't put yourself in front of the momentum you don't do these things it makes yourself wickedly uncomfortable yeah you're never gonna find out what it could be on the other side of the fence yeah you know there's I mean? you're hitting on that uh i don't know if it's cliche but growth yeah. comes from outside of your comfort zone so put yourself outside of your comfort zone that's good advice and, man and again that's being a rider yeah you, to pull to do your first rail is scary as hell right yep. you know you're like oh my god our first set of doubles yeah whatever until you do that that an uncomfortable spot and now you yeah. have the next uncomfortable spot to go conquer yes you know and, and and i think it's an important thing man stay positive and will things into place man like don't don't step back and hope they're gonna happen make it happen man and don't have the reins about, yeah <laughs> motherfuckers get it <laughs> enjoy the journey man because they're pretty good when you sit back and look back on it you're gonna be like fuck yeah that was cool it goes by that fast guy. too i'm sure yeah it does which is crazy <laughs> dude, this has been so good ron thank you no, I, I appreciate you dude thank you yeah. for doing this is fun this actually helped me get out of my covid mind which was nice. hell yeah <laughs> welcome, welcome back get out of your covid mind you're in florida anyway nobody gives a shit about covid in florida <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so funny with the Florida shit. I, I'm almost mad that considering COVID, everyone's are moving here. Yeah. I joke, I'm like, hey, Florida, Florida marketing team, we need more alligators eating kids. Yeah, more, for like, real. Florida man. Yeah. It's deep here. Everyone keeps moving here. Now it's getting expensive. I'm like, no, no, no. This is our, this is our redneck Riviera, man. Like, yeah. I, it's weird as hell. <laughs> Not everyone likes it, which is the good thing. Yeah. Don't make it expensive, you know. <laughs> yeah. Shit. All right, Ronnie. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you, dude. It was awesome I appreciate you more. I hope we see. I hope yeah. We get to Let's cross paths soon. this year. We'll I'll see. I'll be seeing you for sure. I'm if, absolutely coming out there. I want to come out and see the whole whole crew out there and stuff. Fuck yeah, so. do it. And if I come to Florida for work this year, I'm hitting you up. Well, please do if you need I Cause, Especially because you're in commercial real estate and my job is real estate stuff. So we, 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 oh, can, love to, we can do some talking. Yeah. You know? I love to shit. Hey, I got spare room, man. If you ever need something or whatever, if you're ever here. Hell yeah. Me, I love it. All right. Well, thank you, Ron Bonner. I'm actually going to go hang out with Ryan and Jamie Stairs here and Gage Sharps here. So we're actually going to go, go cool. have some beers and go hang out with those dudes right now. So All right. Enjoy your Sunday, and uh, I'm going to end the recording later, guys. I appreciate it, dude. Have a great one. Hello. You've reached the end of the video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Leave a comment below if you have anybody that you'd like me to reach out to and interview. And other than that, just thanks for watching. Thanks for the encouragement, and thanks for liking and subscribing and helping the show grow. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next week.